good to go? I have been up since 2 a.m. <laughs> I expect him to take off any couple of minutes. So I watched the match, and then I couldn't go to bed after oh, the match because I was so oh, pumped up and I was watching the interviews. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's only every four years. I mean, you know. Oh, I don't need to turn her off. Never mind. <laughs> I love the spring bottles. It's okay, fine. So. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we connected to Las Vegas? Correct, we are connected. And they can hear us okay? Yes. All right then. We will then call to order the meeting of the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners for Saturday, November 2nd, 2019. Commissioner Olmberg, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could we have the roll call of the commission, please? Chairman Johnston. Here. Vice Chairwoman East. Here. Commissioner Olmberg. Here. Commissioner Barnes. Here. Commissioner Cavillia. Here. Commissioner Hubbs, Here. Commissioner Keel, Commissioner McNinch, Here. Commissioner Valentine. Here. And Commissioner Keel is with yesterday is, is absent due to a family commitment uh, that he let me uh, know about prior to the meeting. Would the members of the cabs uh, please stand and announce your presence? All right, thank you all. Any cab members in Las Vegas? There are no cab members in Las Vegas, Mr. Chairman. However, your voices are really low. Yours are not. I don't know if the mics aren't on. Okay, we'll try to get the uh, balance on the uh, volume between Reno and Las Vegas. Thank you. All right. If it, I hope that woke, if anyone was up all night watching South Africa win the Rugby World Cup like I was, that definitely woke you up. I knew I would work that into this meeting somehow. Okay, are we got the volume adjusted okay? Kathy, how's the volume now? Volume is fine. We don't see any video, though. Are you videoing yet? Video is up, according to uh, Mr. Vasey. Okay, what we see is Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners, November 2nd, 2019. We don't see the commission, which is normally what we see. So let me refresh my screen. I'll let you know. That would be great. And I apologize. I did not hear you say whether you had cab members present or not. No cab members. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Are we good to proceed then? Okay. All right. Uh, with that, we'll move on to agenda item 14, approval of agenda. Chairman Johnston for possible action. The commission will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The commission may remove items from the agenda, continue items for consideration, or take items out of order. It's my understanding that we do not have back from LCB the regulations under agenda items 18 B and C, so we need to remove those from the agenda and put them on the agenda for a future meeting. Is that correct? Okay. So that's one comment I have to the agenda. Any other comments or questions on the agenda? 
Any public comment on the agenda in Las Vegas? No public comment, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any public comment on the agenda here in Reno? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for any further discussion or motion. Vice Chair East. I moved uh, to approve the agenda with respect to the removal of 18B and C to a different future Second. agenda. Okay. Sorry. I have a motion by Vice Chair East, seconded by Commissioner Valentine to approve the agenda as presented with the exception of agenda items 18B and C will be removed and re-agendized at a future date. Everyone clear on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 8-0 with Commissioner Keel absent. Member items, announcements, and correspondence. Chairman Johnson, informational commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record. Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wasley may also be discussed. Any member items or announcements, correspondence? Secretary Wasley, anything? Okay. All right, uh, with that then, we'll close agenda item 15 and move on to agenda item 16. County advisory boards to manage wildlife member items, informational. Cab members may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action will be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Any cab items? Mitch? Mitch McVickers, my fun county. Uh, the Rio Tano or Kennecott properties out in Ely. The Bassett Lake, we've put a lot of fish in it lately. And they're, uh, they're wanting to do something with that dam. And I don't know where that's at or the department or anybody's talked to. I have the guys phone number that go over that project if anyone would like it. But just trying to make sure we keep something, a little more opportunity there for fishing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other cab items? Seeing none, we'll close agenda item 16 and move on to agenda item 17, landowner compensation tag committee report. Committee chair Brad Johnston information, informational a report will be provided on the committee's recent meeting held on November 1st of 2019. So the landowner compensation tag committee met yesterday morning prior to the commission meeting and it's a fairly limited uh, agenda. Um, we, we've already discussed at the commission level issues related to if the statutory cap was to be met or exceeded and how landowner tags would be allocated and that's moving at the commission level. But one of the final items that the committee is taking a look at in conjunction with the uh, department is developing a protocol and I don't believe it'll require any amendments to the administrative code or that, but a protocol by which uh, the deer and antelope counts are conducted. And this especially comes into play when a participating landowner may have multiple properties. And, and, and if they are spread out by distance, do you combine the count or the counts separate? And I believe the consensus between the committee members um, unanimously, as well as the department, was that if you have multiple properties that can be counted at one time, for instance, in one evening or in successive days, then those counts could be combined. But if you have separate properties where you are counting one property at one time of the year and another property at another different time of the year, those should not be combined, those should be separate. And so we're working to develop that protocol. That protocol will first be presented to the committee uh, and then hopefully to this commission for its, to give, give guidance to the department. So there is consistency throughout the state as to how the animal counts are being conducted for the landowner uh, compensation tags. Um, you know, we have a variety of interests on the committee, a lot of discussion that we've had, but it, it appears to me that this committee will be winding down 
uh, as we move through this final issue as to the protocol. We've looked at a lot of issues through the landowner compensation tag program, which was the task of the committee, but the overall feeling was the program works very well. There's no need to make wholesale changes, but two items that needed to be addressed. What happens if we hit the statutory cap? And do we have a proper consistent framework to conducting the animal counts for the property owners? And the protocol that we discussed yesterday would also give the property owner a bit of the ability to determine how the counts will be conducted by how they apply and how they request their counts. So we feel confident that we can develop this protocol that the landowners who participate in the program as well as other stakeholders uh, can have further confidence in this program and consistency on how the counts occur. So did I cover that adequately, other members of the committee or anything? Beautiful job. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Barnes? Okay. All right, and I want to thank, too, um, Mr. Donham and Mr. Cox for their work, uh, as well as Mr. Wakeling with that committee. They've, they've done a really good job on educating us on some issues, and um, it's run very smoothly, so I want to extend my gratitude to them. That's all I have for that agenda item, so then we'll move on to agenda item 18A. Commission general regulations for possible adoption, public comment allowed. Commission general regulation 487, use of live bait fish and tackle restrictions, LCB file number R060-19, Fisheries Division Administrator John Schoberg for possible action. The commission will consider adopting a regulation relating to amending chapter 503 of the Nevada Administrative Code. This regulation would update and simplify the use of live bait fish <coughs> and other bait and fishing tackle in Indow's western and southern regions. The commission held a workshop on the proposed regulation on September 20th, 2019, and the commission directed the department to revise language for proposed changes in NAC 503-504 regarding areas of use for live bait fish in the western region and other minor cleanup changes. A second workshop on the proposed regulation was held on November 1st, 2019, which was yesterday. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. Uh Chairman Johnson and Commissioners. Uh, for the record, John Schoberg, Fisheries Division Administrator. Uh, on the second workshop yesterday, we walked through um, the proposed changes to those sections of NAC 503 that pertain to bait fish and, and tackle use in some detail. I'd be happy to do that again at the level um, that you desire. The commission memo, which was also provided to the county advisory boards and uh, the public, summarizes those changes um, that were incorporated uh, both from the workshop input um, in September as well as additional staff corrections as we worked through the regulation. What I wanted to do today, and I, I, again, I would be happy to walk through this at whatever level of detail you would like, there are a number of minor um, just editorial grammatical changes to this in corrections of species names that have been carried forward in, in past regulation. But there are in several sections of NAC some more substantive language changes um, that were a little hard to interpret because of the nature of how we had to prepare this. So I put together last night a brief PowerPoint that will show you those those real substantive changes. Um, Randy, next slide, could you? Thank you. Uh, what I presented here, what I'll present here are just the substantive language changes which differ from the LCB recommendations as indicated on the markup, but this will make it clearer. And again, there are, there are other minor changes which are primarily formatting and minor single word corrections that we support as proposed by LCB or in the markup that we provided um, as support material both yesterday and today. Uh, next slide. So in NAC 503-502, as I had oh, thank you, um, mentioned yesterday in the workshop, uh, Legislative Council Bureau had changed our definition of prepared bait fish, commercially prepared bait fish to language that said any fish or parts of fish 
which were used for bait and which were prepared and preserved commercially may be used as bait only in waters where the use of bait is authorized. Our concern with that was that it says any fish or parts of fish, which is not the same thing as bait fish. And the, the key here is that we don't include game fish or certain other species in that allowable use. So we have recommended changing the language back to bait fish as defined in NAC 503-500 because that provides a clear definition of what bait fish are that are commercially prepared and preserved or their parts may be used as bait only in any water where aquatic bait is permitted unless otherwise provided in the appropriate regional regulation because we do have specific areas or in or the entire eastern region where this would not be allowed. So we want to make sure that reference is there. And that phrase, um, unless otherwise provided in the appropriate regional regulation is standard language that's used elsewhere in this statute. So we thought that was appropriate. And then also, and this was a catch that I actually didn't make until yesterday, was realized that or saltwater mudsuckers was still included in that definition of aquatic bait. And we, based on the recommendations of these changes, would would eliminate the use of saltwater mudsuckers. So that was a that was something that had been hanging out in this regulation for a very long time that we just realized didn't need to be there. So those are the the substantive changes to 503-502. Um, I'd be happy to take any any questions or provide further. Any questions at this time? Seeing them. Thank you. And uh, NAC 503-504, which is Western Region, again, this more clearly shows the proposed changes uh, based on, on workshop input and others. Uh, in the Western Region, we will change the debt, remove the word water and use river basin, which allows a broader use of, of allowable bait fish species within a basin, and that was a specific recommendation and request of several of the, the cabs, and it makes sense. Um, for whatever reason, LCB had split out the Humboldt River Basin and the Humboldt River. That was not the intent um, of the original language that we had requested. Uh, our intent is that live bait fish use will only be allowed in the Humboldt River Basin and certain tributaries, not the entire Humboldt River Basin. And that's consistent with the current regulation. So eliminate number two, Humboldt River Basin, three becomes two and provides a clearer definition of areas of the Humboldt River where live bait fish can be used, making sure we identified uh, all waters in the Lovelock Valley, Chimney Reservoir, and the Little Humboldt River downstream of Chimney Reservoir because of an interest on the part of anglers to collect bait fish from that reach and use them in chimney and other waters. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Biologically, there's no concerns. So that clearly defines you know, those areas of allowable use. Uh, added language to define the Lake Tahoe Basin. Our concern there is because the regulations are somewhat more liberal in the Truckee River Basin, we don't want people claiming that Lake Tahoe is part of that. We want to treat it as a separate basin in terms of bait fish use. Um, and then we added language on the new number five for Walker River, excluding the Walker River Paiute Tribe Reservation because uh, that is outside of our authority to set regulation because it's in, that would be on tribal lands. And then finally added that definition of commercially prepared and preserved bait fish in their parts to allowable aquatic bait. Again, um, if there's any questions on these, again, are the substantive proposed changes to 503, 504, if there's any questions or I can provide further. Questions or comments? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And then next slide. This is uh, NAC 503-506. Um, this was something we recognized needed to be clarified. So in the handout support material, it actually got tacked onto the, to the end on page 10 because it wasn't part of what we'd originally submitted to LCB, but we recognized we needed to have that definition of was, was not allowed in the, in the Eastern region. So this adds language um, prohibiting commercially prepared preserved bait fish or their parts along with everything else except salmon eggs in the eastern region and that was the only change there. Any additional or any questions or comments? 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you for putting that together last night. Uh, I, I know I speak for, I think all the other commissioners, very helpful to see that again today in that manner. So I appreciate the effort it, putting it, it together. This was just, the support material was just really hard to read because of the nature of it. So hopefully so. We do have one more. Okay. Um, next slide, please, Brandy, thank you. And then finally in Southern Region, um, 503, 507, again, all of the other changes in here, which are pretty straightforward. I did not put all of them in, only the substantive language change we added, um, which is in section four of 503, 507, um, adding the language and commercially prepared and preserved bait fish or their parts. Um, and it's actually allowable use in the southern region. So we wanted to make sure those were clearly defined in regional regulations along with the definition of what it is so that there was no confusion in regulation of what you could use where. Okay. And that that represents the, the substantive language changes from what LCB had provided. Um, again, there are a lot of minor text changes and corrections in the support material. And I'd be happy to address any of those if you or the, or the public or the CABs have questions. I don't have any questions on those. I know a lot of them were very non-substantive cleanup and changing subsection numbers and grammatical things and things like that. So I don't have any questions. Any questions from the commission or comment? Okay, it is an action item. Any public comment in Las Vegas? No public comment in Las Vegas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Public comment in Reno, Mr. Hyatt? John Hyatt, for the record. Um, section 503, 504, there's a reference to the Southern Pacific Railroad Bridge. Southern Pacific Railroad no longer exists. It was bought out by the Union Pacific, so that either should say Railroad Bridge with no reference to ownership or Union Pacific Railroad Bridge. Any additional public comment here in Reno? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the Commission, um, do we need to rename the railroad bridge? I don't know what it's called. Uh, for, for the record, John Schober, Chief Fisheries, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commission, we would be happy to call the bridge whatever is the appropriate name in regulation and we can research that and make sure that we make that correction before we submit it back to LCB. Uh, as far as I know, there's only one set of railroad tracks that there's only one set of railroad okay. tracks, so if we just said where the, where the train crosses the river, that would probably be fine, but we might want to be a little more formal. Okay. Um, yeah, that probably would be the more appropriate way to define it. I would say the, the, the that way we're not, there's no confusion, although there's only one set of railroad tracks at that location, so. We can, we can call it, we'll, we'll find the appropriate name. Okay. All right, any additional comments or questions? Motion? Do we have public comment? We already took public comment. Okay. Yes. I'll make a motion. Thank you. Um, to approve um, general regulation 487, use of live bait, fish and tackle restrictions, LCB <laughs> file number R060-19, as presented today with the changes that were noticed yesterday with the exception that we will replace the name of railway bridge if it is known under another name or we can describe it accordingly. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Hub, seconded by Commissioner McNinch. Is everyone clear on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, motion carries 8-0 with Commissioner Keel absent. Thank you. With that, thank you. We'll close agenda item 18 and move on to 19 reports informational are we doing 19a again i i like the video i just don't like the beginning of the video um and we I know can do whatever the commission desires i i thought uh, perhaps what we could do is see if there were more people in attendance or different people in attendance that might benefit from seeing it for a first time but uh, we're, we can certainly show it but again anybody who wants to see it can see it on YouTube uh, simply by searching the word reconnecting wild the phrase reconnecting wild with parentheses around the re so 
whatever whatever your desire. I have How a long's your department activity report? <laughs> <laughs> Twenty two minutes. Item. <laughs> it's long enough. Yeah, just right. I, 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 I'll defer. Do, do you guys want to watch the video and have this report again or not? I don't see any. Do I'm okay um, either way, but I did have a question is like, how are they promoting that video? Like, where is that method of communication coming from? Is it strictly from Endow? Is it going out to schools or the community community in some sense? Well, the video, um, certainly the Department of Wildlife is a, is a partner in the effort as far as the, the construction. You saw several employees uh, interviewed throughout the production. It was a production uh, that was really spearheaded and funded uh, through Department of Transportation to kind of highlight that effort. And it was independent of the Federal Highways Administration Award of Excellence that was received, and that was kind of a... a side benefit that was mentioned at the end of that video. So uh, Department of Transportation and Department of Wildlife did some uh, co-produced press releases. Um, it was shown at the uh, Transportation, Wildlife and Transportation Summit held at the Governor's Mansion recently. Uh, it's been promoted through our social media channels as well as Department of Transportation social media channels. There is not a uh, single campaign, you know, really geared towards this video production. However, with Secretarial Order 3362 from Department of Interior um, highlighting the importance of, of seasonal ranges and migration, uh, this migration, this transportation summit that occurred at the governor's mansion. Um, there, and as I indicated yesterday in the presentation, there is just a um, new awareness, a heightened awareness and appreciation for the importance of connectivity. Um, and so it, it goes um, as, as part of a much larger discussion in trying to elevate you know, the importance of connections in these habitats, as well as highlighting some of the efforts uh, that have been conducted. So um, I, I would say it's multi-pronged uh, and it's much broader than just this 12 minute video. So we have, we have posted and had press releases and will continue to do so. Any other comments, questions? <coughs> okay. We can then, I think, move on to the next agenda item, which would be the department activity report. Secretary Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what I'd like to start off with on this report um, is an update on the Cave Lake uh, siphon, the, the dam. We had the field trip when we had our commission meeting over in Ely. There's been uh, significant activity and, and progress relative to some of the repairs and alleviating uh, some of the risk associated uh, with the condition of the dam. Uh, that isn't formally included in the department activity report, but I've asked Deputy Director Rob to kind of give the commission and, and those in attendance an, an update on where we are uh, with that with that project and what's happened uh, since you last saw that. Uh, we completed the engineering portion of the siphon, uh, looked at multiple alternatives. Uh, I know when Tommy was up there, we looked at coming out of the bank right next to the existing siphon. It wasn't really a siphon, it was more of an overflow. Uh, we looked at multiple options. Uh, the option that was chosen was to come out of the spillway itself. It included uh, considerably more piping to do it in that location, uh, but uh, our engineers determined that the best location was out of the spillway. Uh, we did not want to get equipment on that dam face uh, with the stability of that dam face, so uh, we did not go onto the dam. We stayed in the spillway itself. That was the low part that we walked through on our way out there. Uh, <clears throat> they. I was wondering how they were going to get enough pipe out into the water, uh, but they came up with a good idea. They actually took some plastic 55-gallon drums and they floated that pipe out there and then just cut the ropes and let that pipe settle into the water. 
Uh, it's HDPE, it's one section that was fused together. Uh, we have a new water feature in White Pine County now on this spillway. Uh, it's quite a ways down. Uh, it bubbles up. We did not want to have it come directly out because of the velocity of the flow. So it actually bubbles up about six feet uh, at 3,500 gallons a minute. It's pretty impressive to see. Uh, we did turn it on uh, Thursday before Nevada Day weekend. Uh, as a result of turning it on, found that we had too much erosion, so we immediately turned it off. Uh, put in some geofabric, put in some riprap, but at 35 gallons, the riprap is rocks. Uh, the riprap uh, sizing that was chosen to three inch, it was round because that's what we could get in Ely, uh, like a river rock. It didn't hold in place, so we've turned that siphon on and off a couple times. We did run it for 48 hours uh, over Nevada Day weekend, and we were able to drop the lake 12 inches. Uh, that was a concern to our engineers, but it was also coming out of the overflow at the same time it was coming out of the siphon. Uh, our rate of uh, drop that they want to see is four inches per day to let that, if you pull that water down too fast on the backside of that dam, you'll have a real soupy uh, material on the dam that will want to slough down. So they want to control the rate of flow out of that dam to four inches per day to let that dam face naturally uh, dry out. By the time we get that reservoir drawn down, it will be frozen over there. Uh, so the banks will be fine this year because they'll be frozen, but I suspect next spring uh, people visiting Cave Lake will start losing tennis shoes until that thing drives out. So uh, the project uh, went very well, about $185,000 for the contractor to do it. And uh, it's in the end, it's wasted money because when we rebuild the spillway, we're going to have to remove everything we just put in, but it is making it safe to do the other work to continue on with the work at the, at the Cave Lake. So it looks good. Uh, like I said, White Pine County has a new water feature. Uh, I talked to multiple people in town and went by Sports World. Because we're maintaining uh, two-thirds of the capacity of the reservoir, even though it's going to be down 10 feet, it doesn't seem to be it's a concern, but not as big a concern uh, as it would be if we made the reservoir smaller. But uh, people in town seem to be fairly accepting of it. There are some rumors that we have to dispel on occasion, but uh, Sports World and Ely is helping us get the right message out, so we appreciate them. Any questions on Cave Lake? Questions? Thank you. So starting uh, with the director's office, um, again, <coughs> HR 3742, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, now has 148 uh, sponsors, including uh, Nevada Congressman Stephen Horsford and Mark Amade. Uh, the House resolution would provide $1.4 billion in dedicated funding to state and tribal fish and wildlife agencies for conservation and monitoring at-risk species. The bill was first heard in the House Natural Resources Committee on October 17th. Um, I attended the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency Conference in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, helped unveil and present the relevancy roadmap. Uh, that came up a little bit yesterday, and we will have that on a uh, future agenda uh, with, with your blessing, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and do a little deeper dive on that, what that means. And we'll have a report uh, subsequent to this department activity report uh, from both myself and Dag Burkett relative to the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency uh, Conference. 
Reno hosted the American Fishery Society and the Wildlife Society joint annual meeting. It was the first ever uh, joint meeting of, of those two uh, organizations. I had the opportunity to provide some uh, welcoming comments, a welcoming address at the plenary session to approximately 4,500 attendees, highlighting the uniqueness of Nevada, uh, some of our wildlife and, and wild places. I also had the opportunity to present uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Emeritus Jim Sedinger with a plaque of appreciation for his work on waterfowl, bears, and sage grouse as he uh, is recently retired. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I uh, also attended the Transportation Summit at the Governor's Mansion where the department along with the Department of Transportation received uh, the 2019 Environmental Excellence Award from the Federal Highways Administration. The department, for that overpass work that, that we saw uh, about yesterday, the department finalized the agency's update on our funding request relative to Secretarial Order 3362, which is on migration corridors and, and seasonal uh, habitat use. This secretarial order has directed the Department of Interior to work closely with Arizona, California, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming to enhance and improve quality, uh, the quality of big game winter range and migration corridor habitat on federal lands, and that's specific to mule deer, pronghorn, and elk. Um, <clears throat> I was able to uh, present on Nevada conservation and, and wildlife migrations to a, a small group of uh, conservation-minded NGOs that included uh, Trout Unlimited, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, National Wildlife Federation, Pew, and others uh, this week uh, at the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I also attended the Interim Finance Committee meeting um, Thursday, October 24th, where the department uh, received approval for um, additional grant monies to continue fish production activities, support habitat projects in burned areas, and improve wildlife management area activities and structure. Um, Management analyst uh, Kaylee Taylor has attended, uh, had attended the Nevada Gaming Control Board and Nevada Gaming Commission meetings regarding Regulation 4A, which put restrictions on charitable gaming and charitable lotteries. Many conservation organizations submitted letters in opposition and attended meetings as well to voice their concerns about annual events. And, um, this was not a uh, regulation that was on the department's radar. It was nothing that came before the commission, nothing came before the department, and we were originally contacted by Ducks Unlimited, um, who had expressed their concerns and what this regulation would do to their uh, opportunity to uh, conduct their fundraising activities and um, administer like, their, their Green Wing program for youths. Um, and so, along with uh, Ducks Unlimited, um, I think uh, Nevada Waterfowl Association, uh, Nevada Bighorns Unlimited, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, had we had all expressed concerns um, about some of the language in this regulation, which we had interpreted as um, a significant impediment to many of the conservation funding activities of NGOs that encourage uh, conservation ethics in, in youth. Um, Subsequent to the rejection or the, the failure of this regulation to pass, uh, there was a, a article that cited the department's um, language and, and letter and talked about this regulation as a regulation intended to uh, limit coyote or killing contests, specifically coyote killing contests, and that article um, depicted the agency's position as, uh, and, and our comments um, specific to the killing contest context. So um, I'll, I'll share that article with the commission. Um, the department, uh, quite honestly, we didn't have the regulation on our radar. We certainly didn't see its nexus to uh, killing contests, and our comments were based solely on um, trying to preserve the opportunity for youths to participate in conservation uh, NGO fundraising uh, activities. From the game division, 
Uh, in October, the department provided Utah Division of Wildlife Resources with 51 bighorn sheep from the East Range and Stillwater Range in Nevada. Utah released these animals in the Mineral Mountains just east of Beaver, Utah. This was a significant management action for Utah and a great deal of coordination between Nevada and Utah staff. As is often the case with our translocation efforts, there was a good deal of cooperation and coordination from within the department and that of the volunteers who assisted as well. And um, I know Commissioner Keel is not here, but Commissioner Allenberg is. And uh, I had staff uh, specifically uh, approach me and tell me how much um, they appreciated uh, those two commissioners in particular helping out, jumping right in the middle of everything and uh, getting their hands dirty. And it was a, a huge help to the agency to, to have them out there uh, doing that. So um, they had wished that I would express some appreciation and, and thanks to Commissioners Keel and Allenberg for, for their efforts in that capture. The department continues to coordinate with Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe on planning for bighorn sheep restoration effort uh, that's scheduled for this upcoming January. The tribe received a large grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to support the initial bighorn sheep reintroductions, as well as building the staff to support um, monitoring and management of bighorn sheep into the future. As we heard a little bit about yesterday, the documentary film Horse Rich and Dirt Poor was shown during an evening event at the Nevada Museum of Art on October 23rd. Over 300 people attended, and a panel of five subject matter experts provided perspectives and addressed questions from the audience following the showing. Former Commissioner Jeremy Drew served as the moderator for the event, and I know that uh, past Commissioner uh, Tina Nappi uh, was also uh, very engaged and involved in the event. The department participated as a sponsor and presenter at the Wildlife Considerations in Transportation and Planning Summit held on October 15 at the Governor's Mansion. Again, I think this is the third, third mention of that. Uh, opening comments were shared uh, by both uh, directors of the Department of Transportation as well as, as myself. Presentations followed, including information on wildlife migrations provided by staff specialist uh, Cody Schroeder. There were about 95 people attending that represented and 47 different organizations. Several favorable news stories followed, focusing on the ongoing collaborative efforts between Nevada Department of Transportation and the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Chronic wasting disease surveillance continues with check stations, collections at department offices, and collections from taxidermists and meat processors. Currently, the department has collected about 200 samples from targeted locations, primarily in eastern Nevada. Department staff will be providing assistance to the Department of Energy on a mule deer and pronghorn capture on the Nevada National Security Site near Mercury. Uh, that'll occur this month. The purpose of the study is to capture approximately 20 pronghorn and 20 mule deer to test for gamma radiation levels and to learn more about movements of these unique populations that reside on or near highly radiated military test sites in Nevada. The department's working with Bureau of Land Management Applegate Field Office to plan a capture of up to 30 additional pronghorn uh, this upcoming January. Uh, those captures would occur in northern Washoe County and possibly portions of Lake County, Oregon, and Modoc County to increase the sample size and expand the scope of an existing project in this region. The department has been coordinating with Oregon and California biologists as well as staff the BLM to fund, plan, and coordinate this capture effort. The data will be used to augment existing data being collected on pronghorn to delineate migration corridors and use of winter range in Nevada and California. The department's working to develop a new aerial survey application that will allow real-time data collection, rapid analysis, and data storage. Uh, in initial meetings with the successful vendor that was awarded the contract uh, will occur later this fall and project development will probably require over a year to complete. The department eagerly anticipates the completion of this application as it should improve the aerial data collection of big game data. Several new property owners have enrolled in the elk incentive tag program in the eastern region. 
Eastern Region biologists are coordinating with potential new enrollees and evaluating properties. Three properties have instituted landowner antlerless elk hunts this year to discourage elk use on private lands with a fourth property owner in discussions with the local biologist to initiate a hunt this fall. This program is designed to focus harvest pressure on specific animals affecting private lands in a manner that is more easily and quickly initiated than a typical depredation hunt or general hunt. The intent is to use this program in instant instances where there's a high likelihood that a limited tag quota may solve the private land issues. The department's monitoring efforts for botulism in water birds this year has not detected any substantial outbreaks so far. Uh, with the recent cold spells, it's unlikely that we would see that. The addition of water management features at Carson Lake substantially improved the ability to address conditions there. With the weather turning cooler, we may not experience a large botulism event this year other than the minor cases reported in ponds around the Reno area. The department updated the Nevada sage grouse lek database to include all bi-state leks, all California leks, and their lek count observation history. This added about 4,000 records to this data set and represents the first time that all bi-state lek count data are in one database. The department recently requested 150 mountain quail from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife for translocation to Nevada this winter. Do you guys see Craig's ears perk up on that one as, as a bird hunter? The department is involved with a dusky grouse research project in White Pine County. This past year, 18 new grouse were captured and 12 hens were radio tagged. 11 birds survived the summer, although 20% of the nests successfully hatched broods. Eight hens with broods were followed for almost two months with high survival rates. From the Habitat Division, water development crews recently hauled water to guzzlers in the Gabs Valley Range and the Muddy Mountains. An unusually dry summer and high sheep populations in these areas resulted in several guzzlers being drank dry despite recent updates and upgrades to increase water storage capacity. Water hauling was completed in part with the use of a Nevada Division of Forestry water tender truck, which the department was able to borrow. In July, 28 projects were awarded a total of $529,000 from the Habitat Conservation Fee Account to support conservation activities ranging from habitat restoration to species conservation research. Habitat staff announced the Wildlife uh, Heritage Fund project proposal period yesterday and look forward to working with the Commission and the Heritage Committee over the coming months. The Sagebrush Ecosystem Technical Team, which includes department staff, was involved in the establishment and passage of a permanent regulation that now requires compensatory mitigation for anthropogenic disturbances in sage grouse habitat. Uh, that was originally passed October 3rd and the Legislative Commission passed this regulation at a hearing that was held on October 30th in Las Vegas. The department's veg, uh, vegetation and soil survey crew surveyed over 450 sampling plots over the summer. This included sampling sites on the, on the several 2018 fire seeding projects and analysis, analyses suggest that there have been a high level of success with the department and BLM's post-fire restoration work. The department contributed funding, seeds, herbicide, and manpower to treatment of 2018 fires that led to approximately 155,000 acres being treated. The 2019 fire season was considerably lighter with respect to acreage burned than in recent years. However, the fires that did burn had a significant impact to wildlife, specifically mule deer and sage grouse. Coordination of wildfire seeding started with federal agencies late this summer to apply seed in the near future on the on the Goose, Corda, and Cherry fires. Additionally, staff spent considerable time this fall managing aerial pre-emergent treatments targeting winter annual control on over 9,000 acres of 2019 and 2018 fires. Pinya juniper thinning season has started with multiple projects initiating implementation uh, across northern Nevada. Currently, we have greater than 17,000 acres of pinyon juniper contracted for completion by early spring of 2020. Notable projects include Overland Pass, South Steptoe, Patterson Pass, Spruce Mountain, Tule Springs in the eastern region, as well as Edwards Creek and Baldwin Canyon in the western region. 
The Technical Review Program in the Habitat Division continues to work with federal agency partners on several ongoing statewide endeavors, including amending the Wildlife Management in Wilderness MOU and development of wildlife survey best practices and methodologies. The department is also part of a multi-agency shared stewardship agreement. The shared stewardship agreement um, was initiated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture through the Forest Service. Uh, that multi-agency shared stewardship agreement is with, um, as mentioned, Forest Service, but also the BLM, the Nevada Department of Agriculture, uh, Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. That's to collectively prioritize and coordinate wildfire fuels and restoration implementation across the state as well as recreation and wildlife. Uh, additionally, regional staff are providing technical review and comment on uh, following notable projects on public lands. Uh, Ruby Long Valley restoration, Long Canyon phase two expansion, Thacker Pass lithium mine, Washoe County economic development and conservation bill, and ongoing quarterly oil and gas lease sales and analyses. From the Conservation Education Division, chronic wasting disease has been making national headlines. Conservation education staff worked with many national news outlets and local stations to spread education and awareness of CWD. Department staff partnered with Chucker Chasers Foundation and River Bend Hunting Club for two youth chucker hunt events. One was held at the Bullhead Hunting Club in Paradise Valley and the other was at the Bent River Ranch in Yarrington, Nevada. The day started with hunter safety and upland game hunting 101. Uh, the young hunters then gained confidence shooting clays at the trap station before they moved on to pursue live birds in the field. Successful hunters learned to clean their birds at cleaning stations and lunch uh, with lunch served and a, a prize raffle held. The second annual Youth Ducks and Donuts event at the Overton Wildlife Management Area was a great success. Event sponsors included uh, Wildlife Habitat Improvement of Nevada, WIN, the Las Vegas Woods and Waters Club, Sportsman's Warehouse of Henderson, and Arms Corp USA. Las Vegas Woods and Waters Club donated $500 for the event. The department and the Hispanic Access Foundation held two final events in October during Hispanic Conservation Week. The events took place at, at Lake Mead and were a great success. Department staff partnered with Nevada State Parks to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the opening of Nevada's newest state park at the Pitchfork Ranch. The event was well attended with nearly 300 participants. The department stocked fish for the event and ran a fishing derby at the property pond. State Parks staff tagged 80 fish and kids caught and that caught a tagged fish received a prize. Department staff also ran a, a backyard bass casting range and a wildlife education uh, skulls and hides table. The department's Facebook page reached more than 40,000 followers this month with our Instagram following hitting more than 8,000 and growing. From the diversity division, wildlife diversity is conducted bi-monthly radio tracking of 13 desert tortoises in Red Rock National Conservation Area. This is a collaborative effort with the BLM looking at tortoise home range sizes and population connectivity in an area adjacent to high urban development. Red rock tortoises are spending their time in, in steep talus slopes and have been routinely observed on or adjacent to steep cliffs. These are areas that were previously considered poor habitat. Two other studies conducted by partners are also finding tortoises in steep rocky terrain. It's unclear if tortoises have always been found in these areas, but were overlooked based on erroneous assumptions or if we're documenting changes in habitat use away from flatter terrain due to developmental pressures. In the Carson Range, Lake Tahoe Basin, biologists have been surveying for pikas annually for the last five years. To date, more than 40 sites have been surveyed. Some of these sites are active, while others only show signs of historic pika use. Preliminary analyses indicate that pika have disappeared from areas of the Carson Range that are below 9,000 feet elevation, including the entire east shore of the Lake Tahoe Basin. Pikas are still found in many areas around Mount Rose and in other parts of the Sierra Nevada but these populations are no longer connected to one another. The Mount Rose complex of high elevation peaks will likely remain the only part of the Carson Range with persistent pika populations in the future. 
A second round of surveys has been conducted in sandy areas just west of Tonopah to trap pale kangaroo mice. This mouse is a sand obligate with very fragmented populations. Despite being endemic to Nevada, they're rarely encountered. A single pale kangaroo mouse was trapped after four nights of trapping and a DNA sample was collected before release. A total of 57 small mammals of five species were trapped in all. Miriam's kangaroo rat was the most common species captured. This effort has been designed to follow up on historical samples collected in 1931 and is in an, in an effort to reevaluate pale kangaroo mice distribution, better understand their habitat requirements, and contribute to genetic studies attempting to understand gene flow between isolated populations. Another genetic study diversity has been conducting is focused on differentiating various shrew species. This project's been ongoing for the past several years in partnership with the University of Idaho Genetics Lab. We've analyzed 26 samples from 10 species of shrew that were either wild caught or were from museum specimens. We used mitochondrial DNA as well as nuclear DNA to distinguish similar looking specimens from one another as well as look at species distribution and relatedness. The genetic markers were difficult to isolate, but now the sampling's complete. It's possible that species specific diagnostic tests can be developed. In the fisheries division, with the end of the major boating season in northern Nevada, most watercraft inspection stations for aquatic invasive species have closed for the winter, with the exception of the highway AIS station in Lincoln County and AIS stations at Lake Mead and Mojave. The AIS, <clears throat> AIS stations on the Colorado River waters have remained busy with over 600 inspections and 99 watercraft decontaminations in the first two weeks of October. AIS staff provided services at the large Western Outdoor News Bass Fishing Tournament at Colville Bay on Lake Mead with over 70 exiting boats de decontaminated in one afternoon. Phase one of the Habitat Conservation Fee Project to improve fisheries habitat at North, Bass, and Crappie Ponds at Mason Valley was completed in September with the aerial application of herbicide to reduce emergent vegetation. The project will be completed this winter with removal and burning of the vegetation with the intent of having the ponds renovated and ready for warm water fish restocking by the spring of 2020. The Fisheries Division is continuing to work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the states of Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and Montana to update the 4D rule for the endangered species listed bull trout. Uh, Nevada and the other states are developing revised language for the Fish and Wildlife Service to include in a proposed revised rule that will better support state regulations for catch and release sport fishing for this species. Red band trout from the Bruno River drainage are being tested for possible whirling disease based on angler reports of, of a trout with unusual cysts and other possible symptoms. Whirling disease has not been reported before in wild red band trout and the possible cause of this is still unknown. A damaged outlet valve at Willow Creek Reservoir that caused a significant drop in water level was repaired last month with the assistance of Nevada Gold Mines and Barrick. The valves were all replaced last winter, but one of the new valves was damaged during maintenance activities. Fishery staff conducted a salvage operation below the dam, but it appears no game fish were lost from the reservoir. While Southern Region biologists conducted surveys this summer in Lake Mead for the endangered razorback sucker, they collected several wild, unmarked adult fish in Benelli Bay that had not been previously surveyed. This has almost doubled the number of wild spawn fish found in the lake over the past few years. Lake Mead supports the largest self-sustaining population of the Endangered Species Act listed native sucker in the Colorado River Basin. BLM has finally finished environmental reviews for the restoration work at Shoshone Ponds in White Pine County, and work can begin to improve the multiple refuge ponds for Pahrump pool fish. Funding to rebuild the ponds, which were originally constructed in the 1970s, was provided to the department by the BLM through the Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act. This is one of only three locations that support a significant population of the endangered pool fish that was extirpated from Pahrump Valley in the 1970s. From the Data and Technology Services Division, the License Office continues to support customers with harvest return cards, processing tag return and alternate tag allocations. They've been uh, coordinating with conservation education and game divisions to provide updated field condition and disease monitoring information. Staff, along with employees from Calcomai, our licensing vendor, held three days of workshops at our headquarters office to determine future enhancements to the system. 
The 2020 AIS decals and boat registration decals have been ordered and we're currently awaiting their arrival as online boat registrations open December 1st. The TAG office got a new cooperative agreement from an antlerless elk private uh, land, for an antlerless elk private lands hunt, which includes three seasons having five tags each with the first season beginning November 6th. They also have 132 swan permits remaining of the 650 authorized to be issued. The Geographic Information System Program completed the sage grouse telemetry data updates and is in the process of updating the urban wildlife log. This log is intended to capture information about any complaint or report the department receives from the public regarding wildlife. The information gathered provides support for the Conservation Education Division's two urban wildlife coordinators. Uh, collection of that data is also essential in the department being able to make requests to the legislature, being able to articulate specifically uh, the call volume and the amount of, of resources and money that the department directs towards urban wildlife uh, as the departments receive general fund to assist with uh, urban wildlife calls and complaints rather than taking pure sportsman revenue to do, to do those, conduct those activities. GIS program is also in the final stages of program development for the habitat division that will allow easier tracking and comment on the oil and gas land leases that they review. This tool cr will create a large efficiency in their current workflow and save many hours of work. Uh, lastly, from the law enforcement division, four southern region game wardens spent two days surveilling hunters that were reported to be hunting out of area. At the end of the day, the two hunters were contacted following a male shooting a deer. It was determined that a female had a valid tag, but the male who pulled the trigger did not. Felony charges will be submitted to the district attorney. The southern and western region has had investigations on two antelope three deer and one bull elk self-reported by various hunters for the violation of wrong sex of animal harvested. Citations were issued in these incidents and the meat was confiscated. In three of the cases, the meat was donated to local nonprofits to be shared with needy families. Seven Southern Region Game Wardens patrolled the Nevada-California border in an effort to identify California hunters who were hunting uh, potentially unlawfully across the border. Uh, game wardens assisted Wyoming Game and Fish by interviewing subjects in Las Vegas concerning an elk poaching case. A southern region game warden assisted the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other agencies with a marijuana grow eradication and takedown operation. This operation resulted in the identification of one unlawfully killed mule deer. Two southern region game wardens assisted Lincoln County Sheriff's Office with security during the Storm Area 51 event. A Southern Region Game Warden uh, assisted a, uh, excuse me, arrested a felon in possession when he was returning from a hunt which resulted in his parole being revoked. An arrest was also made after an investigation of a self-reported antelope poaching near Round Mountain on a hemp farm. This subject had no lawful tag or license to hunt and killed the antelope while on the farm. Charges are being submitted to the district attorney for prosecution. Three game wardens assigned to Laughlin, Las Vegas, and Battle Mountain successfully completed their field training and evaluation phases and are now on full patrol status. Southern Region Game Warden Chris Walther received two commendations for life-saving while on boating patrol. Game wardens in the eastern and western region investigated several cases involving double kills on one tag for both deer and elk with four deer and three elk unlawfully killed. An Eastern Region Game Warden assisted in finding and recovering a hunter who had died in Hunt Unit 062. Eastern Region Wardens also investigated two hunters shooting deer on private property in Ruby Valley without permission. Both hunters were charged. Game Wardens conducted a second plainclothes operation on the Nevada-Idaho state line and found no violators. During that operation, a Western Region Warden investigated a junior, junior hunter who shot three elk on one tag. Several private property issues were dealt with in Hunt Area 14. This included people trying to push deer off of private lands and private land access issues. In Elko, the Law Enforcement Division has received over 20 calls regarding public lands access issues directly related to SB 316 uh, since its passage. 
Game wardens are investigating an issue at Franklin Lake and Ruby Valley where several complaints have been filed about people accessing the marsh by vehicle. They are coordinating with the Habitat Division on what access the department will allow in the future. Investigations are ongoing into a report of a drone flying in the Maggie Creek area. Western Region Game Wardens are investigating trapping violations involving the unlawful use of bait and failure to visit a trap, along with an investigation of mountain lions feasting on pets and livestock in the Red Rock area. Game Wardens investigated two fallow deer carcasses without heads that were dumped in the Red Rock area. The investigation led back to a local zoo who dumped the animals after they died or were euthanized. A citation is pending for littering. There's an active investigation into the, into the illegal killing of a mountain lion without a tag in the western region. And lastly, game wardens in the western region did a search and rescue at Lahontan Reservoir for a paddle boat that was stranded on the east side of the lake in high winds. By the time game wardens rescued the two subjects, they were severely hypothermic, but both refused medical care. That concludes the department activity report. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the commission for providing us this opportunity to share uh, a small uh, sampling of everything the department is engaged with. Thank you, Secretary Wosley, for that. Any questions? <clears throat> Vice Chair East. Director Wosley, can you um, go back to that swan tag mention? And I'm, I'm just curious because it seemed like there was a pretty large discrepancy, but maybe I didn't hear it right. There were uh, 650 total tags um, available, and there was 132 that remain available. Oh, that, one. Okay, that remain. I think those were the numbers. Okay. Any idea why? Um, I don't know if that number, the, the, the 650 that is available, if that's the correct number, um, has changed through time or if that's been pretty static, but I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's anybody from the game division that has any insight. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that it's always been um, you know, fully subscribed, so. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, with that, thank you, <coughs> Secretary Wosley, for that report. It is appreciated by this commission. With that, we'll move on to the litigation report, agenda item number 19C, litigation report, Deputy Attorney General Craig Burkett. A report will be provided on Nevada Department of Wildlife Litigation. Mr. Burkett. So, uh, as you know from yesterday's hearing, we lost uh, a 15-year veteran representing the Department of Wildlife. And so, uh, in uh, anticipation of that, we've met as a department, Conservation and Natural Resources, me and my chief, to discuss how we're going to handle ongoing litigation for and now and cases that Brian was handling how are we going to handle them what's going to happen with those cases what are our strategies are we going to change strategies um, and so the determination is that uh, I will handle every piece of litigation that the department has presently with the exception of one um, pre the Walker River water rights case uh, Brian has such extensive knowledge on it and is, knows where the bodies are buried, so to speak. Um, we feel like we would like Brian to retain that case. The, the, me and my chief have um, discussed at length the fact that we think he's the best person to handle that. Of course, he's no longer with us, so we would have to contract. Uh, with Brian to do that. Uh, I, my understanding is the director and deputy director in favor of that idea, but there's been a recent LCB ruling on the attorney general's uh, ability to contract, which does, is not helpful. We're trying to work through that ruling. And we're trying to figure out ways that we can make this happen. The, the AG's office has multiple cases that we contract out uh, for litigation most noteworthy is the test site where there's a $5 million contract out with a firm out of D.C. So we do it. Um, there's just been a recent ruling by the LCB that questions the ability of the AG's office to um, 
retain outside counsel. We're working through that issue, but we would like really Brian to handle that. Um, in the meantime, we do have a water rights lawyer, uh, Tori Sondheim, who's been uh, uh, taken over the handling of the case um, until such time as we hope that Brian will uh, will take that case over. Brian has consented to do it. Brian will continue to practice law uh, even after retirement. So uh, with the exception of that case, though, <clears throat> uh, I'll be handling the remainder of the litigation for the Department of Wildlife. Um, I mean, primarily that uh, will be the predator control case that, that Brian was handling that now is in discovery. Um, I'll handle uh, oral argument before the Nevada Supreme Court on the uh, trapping case if, it, if the Supreme Court decides they want oral argument on the issue. And then, um, you know, the other, I, I, Brian and I went through this at length, the litigation report and talking about the cases. The first case that is on your list, we're probably going to remove from the list. It's a case that we believe is probably dead. We're, we were just interveners. The Department of Wildlife was an intervener in that case. And um, we're trying to reach uh, plaintiff's counsel who's hard to reach somewhere in Idaho. But that case will probably be removed. We hope to remove from your report uh, before the next uh, uh, meeting. The other one that we, we hope uh, will be removed is the California piece of litigation, which involves uh, the Mark Smith defamation case, which you know there's a Nevada case that's going on that I'm handling. There's also a California case that's going on that went up for appeal, passed a superior court ruling in California. And um, I'm not going to go on at length, but it, as a result of a franchise tax board versus Hyatt ruling, I think I talked about this before, um, that case we believe and, and the, the Third Circuit has said is, is uh, uh, they've lost jurisdiction over the state of Nevada as a result of that ruling. So that case will be dismissed. And I have an agreement with plaintiff's counsel to dismiss it. It's just a matter of timing, but it will be dismissed shortly. Um, other than that, uh, Nothing to report. <coughs> Any questions? I don't know how you transitioned into the litigation without taking on the Walker River litigation, <laughs> but that's a masterful <laughs> transition practice since it's been going on since, what, the 1920s. I walked into um, federal court with Brian on that case, and I sat and listened to the argument, and I said, oh, my gosh, I have no idea what's going on. This is crazy. Well, I certainly understand the department and the attorney general's desire to keep Mr. Stockton on that litigation as I'm actively participating in it myself on behalf of some private clients uh, in the Walker River case. So it, it certainly makes sense not to lose the institutional knowledge. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you for that litigation report. We'll move on then to agenda item 19D. Conservation Partner Spotlight, Secretary Wosley, informational. An overview of a key conservation partner program will be shared with the commission. Secretary Wosley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as always, I want to express some appreciation for uh, Vice Chairman East for her insight and, and great idea that's now, I, th I think, maybe even a couple years old uh, to create this standing agenda item to hear from some of our partners in the conservation community. And so today uh, we have the opportunity to hear a little bit uh, from one of our uh, one of our partners at the Carson Valley Chucker Club. And just <clears throat> prior to introducing um, Ron Perini, who's here to, to represent the club, I just a couple things I'd like to say. When when you you hear the name of some of these organizations, there's automatic assumptions about who they are and what they do. Um, the Carson Valley Chucker Club. Inherent in that name is a specific geography and one species, but the efforts of this group are much broader than that. They're much broader uh, than just Carson Valley, and they're much broader than, than just Chucker. Uh, they've contributed funding that's been leveraged uh, to Upland Game funding, heritage funding, uh, genetics work on, on blue grouse, uh, trap and transplant, uh, on a whole host of species and a whole host of habitats that have benefited uh, the Department of Wildlife and the wildlife of Nevada in 
in some really uh, broad and beneficial ways. Um, this organization, uh, this past uh, March of this year, uh, their fundraising event, their annual dinner event was their 33rd annual event. So uh, they've been around for a significant length of time um, and they are incredibly valuable partners in more than just Carson Valley and more than just Chucker. Uh, and I hope I haven't stole their, their thunder at all, but I'd uh, really appreciate if, if Ron could come share a little bit more with the commission about who they are and, and what they do. And thanks for, for being here and being willing to share with us today, Ron. And what might not come up is uh, Ron's over 40 years of uh, volunteering as a hunter ed instructor as well. Yes, I started when I was two years old. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioners, I thank you very much just for a short period of time. I want to give you a little bit about how this started in Carson Valley and what we wanted to do. Back in uh, about, oh gosh, I'm thinking it was probably in 1985, one of the things they were trying to do was to try to get more chuckers out in our, our areas more. And so there was some opportunities to try to get more chuckers out. out of, put into different places outside in the uh, pin, Pinion Hills. And one of the things they tried to do was to get those chuckers out there into the different fields and sort of things, and it didn't work too well because obviously they lived in a cage and that's how they were fed. And then when they were brought out there in the wild area, it never really worked that well. But one of the things that you always do, I never forget, we had a guy named uh, Lance Modus Batcher, and I was with him chucker hunting in 1985, um, I think I was a, a captain with the sheriff's office that time and he was a sergeant. And he was talking about what are we ever gonna do about making it better for some of the wildlife that we want to, to see happen better here. And I said, well, one of the things I asked him was, is that what, what did it cost to do some things that we're gonna do and make it better? And they said, we don't have any money at all. So we, I'll never forget when we went to the Carson Valley Inn we put out a whole information and said, we want to start raising some money to see if we can help end out and try to have them be able to do some things that we can't do. The first time they went in that was that we made $11,000. And that was really a good kickoff, it really was. And a lot of people were thinking about, we really want to see if we can do some difference for our area. We have done that now for all those 33 years. That's a long time. And every time we've done that, we have it on the first Saturday of March, which remember, if you could, you wanna come and see us this time, is March 7th. But when we did that, we started out with the Carson Valley Inn and we'd probably get, oh, about 150 people, 200, and it got so big that we had to go to different places out in the fairgrounds and those types of things, which we're still doing. And what we've done, all that period of time, we raised up that 11,000, we went to 20,000, we went to whatever. And one of the things I wanna to mention to you that is so important, and I think is something that we wanna to do better than we're not just getting a hunting license and that's the end of what we have to pay for. What we need to do is to do more to make our wildlife better. And this last year, we actually had a grouse, uh, grass amount of money that we made was 126,000. That's in one night. And when we have 500 to 600 people that come to this place, they are there because they truly want to be good sportsmen. They want to do things that, well, we can make it even better than what it is. And one of the things I want to mention to you is that we don't spend a lot of money when people come there and say, how much is it to have a ticket? It's only $30. Now, nothing against Ducks Unlimited because I'm a duck hunter. And that's not a problem, I go to that all the time. But it's a lot more money, isn't it? When you get there, you have to have $75 to get in, and then you got another $100 to get some raffle tickets, not with us. Because there's a lot of people, I really believe this, there's a lot of people who say that we wanna do what we can, but I'm not very wealthy. I don't have much money, I can't do that. I can't do as much as I wanna do. So when they come into there and they only spend $30 and that's their dinner, which is really good. And plus that, they can start off with that, how many tickets they're gonna get for raffles or whatever it might be. It might be $20, it could be whatever it is. 
because some of these people truly want to be part of a sportsman. They want to do that. They love to hunt, but they don't have the ability to do some what other people can. And what we've done over that period of 30-some uh, years, what we've done is given most of that money, about 90% of it, given it back to Endo. Because they came to us, we asked them to come in, but then they come to see us and they want to say, these are the items that we want to have done this year, projects that need to be done. And maybe we can do the Pittman Robinson money. We can give them some money, part of that one fourth, and then the rest of it goes to them. And they'll be able to get some of the federal monies. And it's made a huge difference, I think, for some of the things we've done. And that's what would really made it good for us. And we probably have brought in over a million dollars without question of how much we've done all those 33 years. But what's nice is, is that Endow comes into us, Department of Wildlife, their people, come in and say, these are the things that we want to have done, that we can make a difference with some of the things around Northwestern Nevada, but that doesn't really matter to us as much. What we want to do is anywhere in the state of Nevada, we're more glad to do so. And it's worked well enough that we can look at that and say, those are good projects. That's something that we think we should give that. Our board does that. And at the end result of it is, we, we give a like I say, the majority of the money that we make on our event. I think in that $124,000 that we made in that night, it was about $550 uh, people that actually came there. It's amazing when they come. It really is. And uh, they have a great time. And I think that one of the things that we're doing at that point is, after that, we want to give a, a, a good number back to our community and to have it what it is. It's made a big difference for all of us. And when we have this time, we don't go and advertise people. We don't do that because we don't have enough room in the place to do it. And it really is. It's true. So what happens is we put it out. We put out letters to each one that's been um, a person that's actually come to our events every year. Actually, two years, we always put them out as far as their names and say, hey, don't forget, on March, whatever it is, we're going to go ahead and have our event. And they come in. And I mean, they come in like you can't believe. We would like to have a bigger place, but that's okay. We're all right with the five and 600 people. That's how much we do that. We don't even have to worry about it. I get phone calls in January. Hey, what day are you going to be doing that? And it makes a big difference. I want to give this to you. If you don't think there's not a lot of work with this, it truly is. There's nobody paid in our event. There's nothing. It's all people that just do it. And I want to pass these on to you, if I may. These are, these are some of the things that would look as auction items and raffles. This is what we do. And one of the, I think one of the things that are really, really important and I think is important is that we, we get a lot of people that want to give us money to be able to get some items for our event. And if you look at it, there is, this is we have over, um, usually over 100 raffles and each one of those have to be worth at least 100 or more. And then we have auctions that are probably around 50 to 60 of them. And then at that point is that's where it goes. And that's where a lot of the money we have. A, the raffles are unbelievable as far as how many people get their tickets and what they do. And this kind of gives you an idea how many people really, truly want to do something for our wildlife. That's what I'm trying to say to you. They really, truly do. They come in there. They spend their money. They really, truly want to win something, obviously, but at the same time, the big objective is already being done is the fact that we're we'll be able to make a difference in all that. So I wanted to also show you, this is the, the ones that we do two years in a row, like that would be next year and a year after that. Um, what we do is we give out a letter to each one of those people, and I'll give those to you. This tells you exactly from the people that came to our event last year, we'll know at least that we are moving forward again on that and what day it is. And it tells you what some of the projects that we've already uh, paid for all the accompl accomplish of our event. I, fi I finally want to want to say a little bit to you about this is is that we enjoy doing doing what we're doing. Like I say, we have a, a board member that's really great people that want to do a lot of things. Um, we do great food, we've got great fun, we have people coming there each time. We've got great events uh, that are going forward for like, for example, uh, we do some for the youth, if there's something with the 
uh, events dealing with fishing or something for the youth or whatever it might be, we do give some money on that besides Endow, but far from the majority is that as actually by them. Um, I just want to say is that, you know, a long time ago, one of the things that we truly wanted to do was the guzzlers, and that was a lot of years ago that really made a big difference, especially around our area, and that worked out really well for us. We've done some uh, other, other kinds of projects, again, for the youth and for others that are dealing with wildlife, and uh, I just think it's been a really a lot of fun. I think one of the things that you need to realize, too, though, is this, is that the people truly, really want to be hunters. They want to be people in wildlife. They want to do a difference. They want to do something that makes it good and that they can have enough money to be able to give it to us, and it does make a difference. So that's kind of what I wanted to show to you, and that's what we're doing, and we're always welcome to have you there. Um, I'll try to get your names. I'll send you the letter and say, if you want to come say hi, you can. But it's on the 7th of March. Don't forget that. And it's in Garnerville, Nevada. Does anybody have any questions for me? Any questions from the commission? Vice Chair East. These things are hard to deal with. Thank you so much. This is really important to me in particular because I just was not aware when I came on the commission how much is being done out there by our sportsmen through organizations like yours. And so I really appreciate this presentation and, and the department for hearing me and giving others the chance to hear about it too. So I have the date on my calendar. We'll see how it goes. But thank you so much for your presentation appreciate today. That. Thank you. Absolutely. And any other questions or comments? I just want to thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to come and speak with us and share some information about the club. We hear a lot about it. We see the club's name next to dollar signs at various points in time. And uh, we thank you for everything that you do for, uh, for the Nevada's wildlife and, and keep up the good work. I, I have not attended this dinner, so I'm going to mark down March 7th on my calendar and try to get out there if I can. So I, I appreciate all the work that you guys do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. If I, could, my, my, I forgot one thing. It's just a 501c3. Sure. So it is is a, under that. It's not something of a different kind of a program. It's nothing like that. It's obviously done correctly. And each one of those dollars that go to that is absolutely done correctly. Okay. I just wanted to make sure of that. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, why don't we take a, a break until 10 after 10? And we'll resume then with the uh, Mr. Jackson's predator predation management report. Okay, thank you.
Okay, if everyone could find their seats so we could resume. You know, I'm enjoying this more than an Alabama national title, I think. You would be? Yeah. You know, then you, as an Alabama fan, you get used to it every year, and the Rugby World Cup only comes around every four, so. It's getting too stressful is what it's getting. Okay, we'll then move on to agenda item 19E, predation management, fiscal year 2019 report, wildlife staff specialist Pat Jackson, informational. The game division will present the 2019 predation management report. Per commission policy 23, the department shall prepare an annual predation management status report Detailing results of the previous fiscal year's projects, the status report shall be presented at the last commission meeting of each calendar year. Mr. Jackson. Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. Hello, commissioners. I'm gonna provide the 2019 uh, status report on the Predator program today. A uh, new slide I've thrown in. Uh, I've never heard the $3 fee program referred to as a garden, but if one did, we're starting to have some, uh, some uh, some things sprout regarding uh, collaborations. These are titles of four talks that were given at the recent National TWS meeting uh, that was here about a month ago in, in Reno. And so that, that first talk regarding ravens and sage grouse is a product from our Project 41, which I'll be discussing the impacts of recolonizing black bears on lions. It was a talk from Project 32, a project that's now ended. Uh, carnivore symmetry in a core habitat of black bears is actually a, uh, an add-on, a bonus, if you will, from our passive model that we have an outside collaboration with. And then estimating reproduction and survival of unmarked mule deer offspring was an uh, offshoot and a small collaboration with the new professor at UNR and has recently been submitted for publication. So uh, as we form more outside collaborations and bring more uh, experts on board, I'm happy to invite them here to share their work and findings in greater detail. So I would encourage the commission, if you have anything of interest, please let me know and I can uh, attempt to facilitate that. I did have somebody on the books to come today to discuss our passive black bear model. However, being a professor in Michigan, he could not leave until today. It was scheduled to arrive at noon and so we decided to postpone that and I'm glad I did because I don't think he would have wanted to have come back after lunch. Uh, so the, uh, the $3 fee just is a, a 30,000 foot level. Right now it generates about $700,000 a year. Of that, $14,000 goes to administrative fee for Nevada Department of Agriculture. The rest is allocated towards predator plan projects that we review and approve annually. Uh, staff salary, and if we don't spend it, it does remain in reserve. It isn't reverted back to a general fund. And so with some legislature changes that we saw in the 2016 session, those fees can be spent on the management of predatory wildlife, uh, research techniques on lethal control, and the protection of sensitive species. Uh, another part of that is the 80% mandate. We have to spend 80% of those revenues on lethal removal for the fiscal year, which we have accurate records. So at the time that I draft the predator plan, that's two fiscal years prior. So though I'm reporting on fiscal year 19, we're using the revenues from fiscal year 17. And so in fiscal year 17, we saw just over 643,000. We needed to spend almost uh, 515,000 to reach that mandate, and we spent uh, 528,000, so uh, we came in at 82%. And I threw this slide in just to remind the commission of our levels of monitoring, standard, intermediate, and rigorous. There are a lot of projects where we have approved, have looked at the literature, and go out, conduct predator removal, and don't collect data to uh, quantify an impact uh, necessarily. And so I don't always have findings for all of these. So Project 21, uh, this is uh, common raven removal for the protection of sage, greater sage grouse. Uh, this is a collaboration with wildlife services. Around the state, or backing up a little bit, we annually get a uh, depredation permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, remove 2,500 ravens. On this particular project, uh, Wildlife Services removed almost 1,800. We had an outside collaboration with the USGS looking 
at uh, oiling eggs so that they don't hatch. That's also con considered a take by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So we allowed the USGS to uh, conduct that removal on our permit. Um, and so we came in a little under budget and we would encourage continuing this project into the foreseeable future. Um, project 2102, a subset of project 21, it's a, a, a larger effect or a more effort of ravens removed in uh, the Virginia mountains. It's a collaboration with wildlife services and the USGS to look at the impacts of uh, raven removal on greater sage grouse. And we had a, uh, an unexpected large wildfire a couple years ago, which had kind of confounded the uh, uh, findings. And so we decided to postpone this. And I should say that the USGS component of this project is funded uh, through revenues other than the $3 fee. And they almost removed 600 ravens on this project. 2201 is the for protection of California sheep in 011 and 013. Uh, we use both wildlife services and private contractors. Uh, we also released 19 sheep on Massacre Rim in 011, 12 of which had GPS collars. And uh, during this last fiscal year, uh, wildlife services removed four mountain lions and a contractor removed two in 011, and we did not have any lion predations on March sheep during that time, which is the response variable that we look to measure. And we would uh, encourage the continuation of this project uh, until the population reaches the viability as outlined in the uh, annual predator report. Uh, project 22074, uh, we didn't spend much, uh, we didn't do much. We have a, uh, a, a, slight, a small population of rocky bighorn sheep that are slowly coming back they are wearing GPS collars. We're scheduled to uh, redeploy some more with the $3 fee uh, here in the next couple months. Uh, this went from a smaller herd where we did proactively remove lions, marked some sheep, didn't have any mortalities, and it's transitioned into uh, instead of a proactive or reactive. And so we maintain this project and the ability to remove lions, however, uh, aren't currently doing so. Project 32 was a collaboration with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the department. Uh, the final report, which I encourage you to look at, is in the, in the appendix of the uh, uh, document, or uh, in the appendix of the predator report, and a talk on this was given at the, uh, the National uh, Wildlife Society conference. Project 37, this uh, permits the department the ability to remove mountain lions in a quick manner uh, in isolating circumstances around the state when we may have uh, uh, issues that arise quickly. Uh, and so I work with the area game biologists to, uh, to, to figure out where the, those works need to be performed. And we use both wildlife services and private contractors. Wildlife services removed one line in Unit 41, and I had a private contractor remove one from the Jacksons and three from the Calicos. He did also work in the snowstorms during the summer, uh, but there were uh, very, very little mountain lion sign at that time. And so uh, this is, a, a, a very dynamic project. It changes a lot in how we use it year to year, and we do uh, recommend continuing it to allow us the ability to remove lions quickly. Uh, in a very similar project, Project 38, uh, the ability to remove coyotes for game protection around the state. I also work with mountain lion, or I'm sorry, with area game biologists to identify needs, and this is really just uh, collaboration with Endow and Wildlife Services and they remove coyotes either from the ground or using uh, aerial, aerial support. And so they removed 72 coyotes, primarily in uh, pr fawning pronghorn habitat, and we would also encourage a continuation of this project. Project 40 is a, is a multi-year, multifaceted management project in Eureka County. It started out in just Unit 144 and then was grown to uh, all of Area 14. Uh, it started after a few years of other aspects of management, pinion juniper removal, feral horse roundups, uh, and some private predator control. And it's a collaboration with Wildlife Services, who does the predator removal of lions and coyotes, but we're also deploying collars on does, and that uh, goes into our uh, uh, monitoring. Increased understanding of common raven densities and space use in Nevada. This is an inside project within Indow where we purchase and deploy 
Argos transmitters or GPS transmitters that fit on the backs of ravens. We monitor those and pick them up if and when they fall off or the ravens die. We also do a lot of nest monitoring and do a whole bunch of rapid point count surveys uh, before and after raven removal to, uh, to look at changes in raven density. Um, but this is also a very large collaboration with the USGS. Their report is also in the appendix of the, of the predator report, and I would encourage you to look at that. I'm not going to rattle off all of these names, but we have 10 uh, ongoing uh, components of, of raven research uh, within the state, and uh, that's something I'm pretty proud of. And we're learning all different sorts of things about raven uh, space use, habitat use, subsidy use, uh, um, et cetera. And so the department supports continuation of Project 41. Uh, Project 42, uh, assessing mountain lion harvest in Nevada. This is looking at our harvest data as well as some existing GPS data and other, other data points to uh, build an a integrated population model for uh, mountain lions around the state. It was started a few years ago. To date, we ha don't have any expenditures. It took substantially longer to get all of the other researchers in Nevada who possess lion GPS data uh, to get on board. However, that has happened. And in, in this past week, I've had uh, some pretty substantial conversations with the two uh, researchers uh, conducting this. And so final report will be in hand uh, uh, this time next year. The uh, Project 43 is the meso predator removal to protect waterfowl, turkeys, and pheasants on two different wildlife management areas. Collaboration with Wildlife Services. A few years ago, uh, local area managers said that they had really, really low uh, 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 nest success and really small clutches. Uh, so we have Wildlife Services go in for a few months out of the year and remove uh, any number of uh, meso predators to uh, to increase those. Uh, that nest success and clutch size. Project 44, lethal removal and monitoring of mountain lions in Area 24. This was a project that started within Project 37, the statewide management project. We have an underwhelming or underperforming bighorn sheep herd in the Delamars, and that's been going on for some time. There was a concern that mountain lions may be contributing to that, proactively remove mountain lions, and then created our own project, identified as Project 44, uh, are marking lions with GPS transmitters, and instead of proactively removing lions for visiting their kill sites and only removing uh, uh, lions that are consuming uh, the, the local sheep. And so uh, of interest, uh, there is a, a robust feral horse population in, in the area, and as you can see, going to 250 kill sites in this most recent fiscal year, 67 of those sites contain horses. That has been observed in, in some lion research that uh, was done in the western part of the state. But in other aspects of the west, looking at lion diet, uh, even though horses were present, lions chose to consume uh, deer and elk and, and didn't consume horses at all. And so that's a fairly impressive uh, consumption rate of horses, particularly one adult male lion seems to be very proficient at uh, consuming adult horses. Most of the time, it's uh, foals or uh, horses about a year old. And so uh, this is just some pictures that the technician going to those kill sites has uh, collected. Um, but we're pretty excited about this and are looking at an outside collaboration with Utah State and the USGS out of Fort Collins uh, and the BLM to continue marking lions, uh, removing lions that uh, uh, consume sheep, but then work with the BLM and the other two entities to in a couple of years, remove uh, uh, mountain lions, I'm sorry, remove feral horses from half of where we have mountain lions and see what mountain lions do uh, with that uh, reduction in prey base of horses. And so um, we recommend uh, continuing mountain lion uh, monitoring, but then also uh, in removing offending individuals, but to expand on that uh, collaboration with outside entities who are providing uh, resources and funds. Um, and I, I think this is a pretty exciting project. Uh, project 45, this is our passive black bear population estimate in the state. Uh, that's a uh, picture of where uh, Michigan State technicians have uh, monitored uh, black bear uh, presence absence with both hair snares and cameras. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a collaboration with Michigan State and University of Montana. 
uh, so far uh, for the past two years, they've put out 100 camera and hair snares across about 5,000 square kilometers. Uh, they have over 300 hair samples and over 1.2 million photos uh, that they are aggressively processing. And uh, the, the first year, the first field season of this project was extremely hot and arid two summers ago, as I'm sure we all remember. This most recent summer was fairly mild. And so the department does recommend a third field season uh, to hopefully have some sort of uh, average um, with, with bare habitat use and, and weather. And so we would recommend continuing this. And so with that, I will entertain any and all questions. Any questions for Mr. Jackson? I had just a couple questions on the report, because um, as we're getting used to the projects and um, what they entail, and it just has to do with some of the graphs on page 14 and 15, um, looking at the mule deer uh, populate or spring fawn adult ratios in, I guess, in response to removal of coyotes. And then you have on the next page, coyote removal and the PMU LEC survey total. And my question is on the coyote removal for the P diamond PMU, you're not tracking precipitation, whereas in the mule deer graph you are, and I wanted to know why. Uh, Commissioner Hubbs, my paper document is in my bag, so let me go grab that really quick. Uh, again, Pat Jackson's death specialist for the record. And so your question referred to uh, the uh, charts on page 14 and 15 regarding uh, one having precipitation and the other not. Is that That's correct. accurate? So uh, to back up a little bit, any, any area biologist that has a, a project within their area, I request that they uh, provide a, a report or an update on how things are going. And now is a great time for me to compliment uh, area biologist Clint Garrett, who always uh, goes well above and beyond. And so I can ask him why he did not include that, but uh, I do my best to not edit their reports too much since I want them to be theirs. So I don't know why he didn't include that, but I would uh, agree with you that that would be a good addition. Yeah, and I was looking at this because, you know, obviously one, um, there appears to be a negative correlation and then the other a positive correlation. So you're trying to understand potentially if this predation removal is impacting this figure that you're monitoring. So there's also like no statistical significance or standard deviation. And I just think there's so many other variables. I know it's so difficult to track everything, but um, habitat loss, precipitation, sometimes I'm, I'm thinking we might have that data on hand and we can see if it's truly the predation removal that's causing these changes or if there's another, you know, it's just interesting to me that you see somewhat of a flat, um, a flat line um, with precipitation here and then obviously a slight downward line, which is kind of a different result, but you know, it doesn't look like it's very significant, so we don't really know on the mule deer removal, you know, coyote removal for mule deer. And then on the other one, though, when you're looking at the, the leg survey, you're starting to see at least an upward movement, which is kind of interesting, but again, we don't know the significance, and it's not tracking precipitation there. And so I was trying to start to understand, like, I think the long-term data that's driven from the removal and also, if there's other variables that can easily be tracked by the department, that we add them so we can see if there's another variable that's 
also really could be associated with the um, data that we're monitoring, which in this case is spring fawn adult ratio, and then the other case, the LEC survey total. Commissioner Valentine, did you have a question or comment? Uh, Mr. Jackson, you know, so many of our projects are Raven related. Are we getting any closer to increasing the take numbers on Ravens in the state of Nevada? Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. Uh, that is a little above my pay grade, but the word on the street, uh, Wildlife Services should be completing their EA soon, and the findings of that could result in that, but I uh, haven't been in any of those meetings. Any other questions? I have one. Can you just give us a, a, just a brief overview of the report on Project 32? That was the black bear lion interaction. I don't believe I had the in the appendix the report in my material. Um, so just and I, I just at a very high level. Uh, sure. So Pat Jackson, staff specialist, for the record, uh, the 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 question is. Uh, do uh, mountain lions consuming uh, uh, deer, do, do bears exploit that? Do they come in and do they uh, interact with that mountain lion? Do they consume that, that deer and, and take that off? And, and they certainly do. So uh, they I apologize. They certainly do? Yes. So mountain lions do uh, lose their prey to, to bears. Now, uh, I don't know. How, Bears would have to spread to more of Nevada to see that phenomenon happen more. Um, and I apologize that this didn't make it into the support material. The, uh, in various parts of the report, uh, it uh, directs you to the appendix, which is on our website, but um, it didn't make it in. Okay. So but the, it, it, it summarizes Project 32 and how many lions and bears were captured and, the, uh, and uh, some, uh, some various results. So it's, uh, it's not uh, that long, so I, I apologize you don't have it. But. That, that's all right. I, so if bears continue to expand their footprint, so to speak, in the state of Nevada, and they then consume a, uh, what a lion has killed, or take it from the lion for lack of a better term, can then you have an uptick in predation then? by lions to compensate for the kills they lose to the bears? Is that the next step or question you have to ask? Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. So, uh, and, and this is speculation on several fronts. So uh, looking at uh, Nevada prior to uh, uh, settlement, we probably had more bears and less lions. And uh, there are more and different groceries on the landscape, and again, this is just my opinion, but if and when bears spread throughout the state, I would expect uh, to, to see fewer mountain lions in the same amount of space that used to have more because of the presence of bears. I'm sure there are other uh, predator researchers that would disagree with that, but that's what I think would happen. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Vice Chair East. Okay, so I'm not a biologist, so this question might be silly, but would a bear take down a deer on its own? Uh, or does Jackson. it just go after, I'm sorry, or does it just go after something that's already down? Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. Bears will consume fawns at a fairly uh, notable level, by, and, and I'm sure that uh, periodically adult bears do take down deer, but for the most part, if a, mount, or if a black bear is consuming an adult mule deer, it was killed by something else. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner More Mike. of a comment. I just wanted to say congratulations on all the information that's been, you know, taken from some of this the funding to understand raven biology, the impact of, of ravens on the sage grouse, and publishing all those articles. I think that's wonderful. Thank you. I'd just like to make a comment. I, 
I think back about six, seven years ago when I walked into, I think, my first commission meeting as a cab chairman and predation management was a topic on that agenda. And I think about where we were then and where we are now uh, in terms of this report, the plan, the information that's going out to everybody. And I think we're just miles. We've advanced the bar. And, and I want to thank the department, Mr. Jackson, for all your work and, and the work of the commissioners and, and that, because I think we have come a long, long way. And I think a relatively short period of time and getting some really beneficial information in that. So I just want to say thank you to everybody involved, Mr. Wakeling, Mr. Jackson, Director Wosley. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, with that then we will move on to, no further questions or comments, so we'll move on to agenda item 19F, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Conference Report. Secretary Wosley and Deputy Attorney General Craig Burkett, a report on the 2019 conference will be provided. Sirs, I don't know who's taking the lead. Uh, I will start, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Again, um, so each year there are a couple uh, regional meetings and a couple national meetings. Uh, they basically occur one per quarter. Um, there's a meeting uh, in January that's the midwinter meeting of the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. The Western Association um, has been around uh, for a century. Most of the states, I believe west of the Mississippi, it does include the Dakotas, Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, and, and westward. Um, and then there's a national association uh, that meets in conjunction with the North American Wildlife Management, uh, Natural Resource and Wildlife Management Conference that occurs annually in March, rotating locations. And then in July, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has an annual meeting and then in the fall, uh, September each year, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies meet. Uh, this year was the 109th annual meeting of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. It was in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I, I know I've shared with the commission and, and CABS and uh, public in attendance in the past. As a, uh, a field biologist, uh, I didn't always understand the value of regional and national association meetings. As a uh, political appointee and an agency director, I now uh, not only understand the importance, but I really value the opportunity uh, to continually keep um, Nevada and Nevada issues uh, on the radar. Uh, and front and center. I, I learn from uh, peers in, in other states, provinces, territories. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity for professional networking. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity to develop unified positions on key and emerging issues, and it's an incredible opportunity to have uh, access to high-level federal officials in that uh, these conferences are sponsored uh, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, first and foremost, but the Forest Service, uh, BLM, Park Service, uh, Department of Agriculture, a um, whole host of, of federal partners, uh, industry partners, NGOs, and they always provide a, a really uh, incredible opportunity, again, for professional development, networking, uh, unified positions and access to those individuals. So I'm, I'm going to share um, the program um, from this year's meeting just so you can kind of look through and get a feel for it. I'll, I'll tell you that um, as a director at this meeting, um, they really, really keep you hopping. It's all day, every day from uh, 6.37 a.m. till 9.30, 10 p.m. Uh, Saturday, Sunday, uh, all day, every day, uh, with with meetings, uh, double book, triple book, quadruple book, uh, trying to get to places. Um, <clears throat> one of the key things in in this year's um, 
meeting really pertained to relevancy, and, and we heard a little bit about it yesterday. Um, and so five years ago, the Blue Ribbon Panel that we talked about yesterday in conjunction with Recovering America's Wildlife Act made those two recommendations. Recommendation one was dedicated funding. Recommend, recommendation number two was given these broad societal changes, uh, what do we need to do as a conservation community to address uh, relevancy? Um, that was a recommendation that was made about three and a half years ago. Fast forward to this meeting in September, uh, a roadmap to relevancy was unveiled. And again, this is a, an, an item we would like to share with the commission and, and have on a future agenda, share that roadmap. What that roadmap is, uh, it was a one year process uh, that took 60 individuals from state, federal, tribal, industry, NGO, um, provincial, territory, uh, and, and the states, 60 individuals, and looked at the barriers to the relevance of, of conservation, divided those barriers into five unique bins, theme areas that included uh, agency, culture, agency capacity, constituent culture, constituent capacity, and legal and political. Took, took those five theme areas and uh, fleshed out specific strategies to address uh, the, the barriers in, in those five bins. So the plenary <clears throat> that, that kicked off this meeting, as you'll see in there, there were uh, three speakers, including uh, Margaret Everson, the principal deputy uh, director serving uh, acting director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, there was another woman from an organization called Park RX, which is, uh, speaks to the, the uh, health values of being outside, being connected with nature. Uh, and how people that uh, are connected are, are healthier. They have a team of physicians that are actually charting uh, progress, health-related uh, progress, heart disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, those kinds of things, and actually uh, gaining legitimacy in the healthcare arena around that. And then uh, the third speaker uh, was a gentleman named Drew Lanham, uh, who was an African-American, uh, he's a professor, uh, but he's also a, a naturalist, an author, um, an incredible uh, speaker, um, talking about what, what it means to be uh, involved in conservation to him, uh, why conservation is relevant to him. And that, that was really the main theme. It's a, it's a reoccurring theme that occurs not only at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies annual meeting, but also uh, Wildlife Management Institute at the North American Conference on Natural Resources and Wildlife Management that occurs in March every year. It's been a standing uh, plenary topic and conference theme for probably about the last five years. So a lot, actually longer than five years, going on, on a decade. So a lot, of the, a lot of the theme, a lot of the conference was geared towards um, relevance uh, with the unveiling of this roadmap. Uh, as I said, the roadmap was developed by uh, 60 experts. It was reviewed by over 200 individuals uh, spanning all of that as well, and then there, we're kind of at a unique time in the membership of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies as well as the Western Association in that we've had in, an incredible amount of turnover in agency directors, an incredible amount of turnover in federal employees, political appointees, and so there is um, a certain um, uncertainty, but there's also a certain opportunity to um, kind of move, move the needle on this, and so, um, you know, a lot of the, the regular occurring items, um, there are uh, a number of committees, and I'm just gonna read briefly through some of the committees so you know how the, the AFWA structure is, is, uh, is set up, but uh, there's an Agricultural Conservation Committee, Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Committee, Angler and Boater Retention Recruitment Reactivation Committee, uh, Bird Conservation Committee, Climate Adaptation Committee, Education Outreach and Diversity Committee, Energy and Wildlife Policy Committee, Federal and Tribal Relations Committee that, that uh, are taking on um, 
wild horse and burrow issues right now in that federal and tribal relations committee. There's a fish and wildlife health committee, um, CWD obviously an emerging issue there, uh, sharing that uh, we've now documented that uh, uh, feral swine can be uh, vectors, uh, victims and vectors of CWD and what that means uh, to the country. There's a Fish and Wildlife Trust Fund Committee, Fisheries and Water Resource Policy Committee, Hunting and Shooting Sports Participation Committee, International Relations Committee, so CITES, uh, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, um, Invasive Species Committee, a Law Enforcement Committee, Leadership and Professional Development Committee, a Legal Committee, Legislative and Federal Budget Committee, National Grants Committee that approves the multi-state conservation grants uh, of which Nevada has been uh, uh, beneficiary of in a broader sense because they're multi-state uh, grants. Uh, unrelated to us, there's an Oceans Resources Policy, Ocean Resources Policy Committee, uh, Resolutions Committee, Science and Research Committee, Sustainable Use of Wildlife Committee, Technology and Data Committee, Threatened and Endangered Species Policy Committee, Wildlife Diversity, Conservation and Funding Committee, and Wildlife Resource Policy Committee. Federal um, partners and attendees include the Canadian Wildlife Service, which is the equivalent of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management, uh, NOAA Fisheries, National Park Service, USDA APHIS Veterinary Services, USDA APHIS Wildlife Services, U.S. EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service, USGS, um, and so it's, it's an incredibly diverse, um, but again, 106th annual um, relevance and rel the relevancy roadmap uh, key to this particular meeting, uh, but there's a number of standing committees with standing items that um, are dealing with issues near and dear to Nevada, invasive species, wild horses and burrows, um, just, just to name a couple. So that, that's, Kind of concludes my my report. Uh, certainly happy to entertain any questions, um, and I I know that we've had uh, participation from commissioners at at uh, the Western Association in, in the past. I know uh, Commissioner McNich has attended a lot of those, and uh, was really glad to to be able to have uh, Dag Dag Burkett attend this and uh, immediately uh, connect with uh, legal uh, representatives from. Uh, many of the state wildlife agencies that are regular attendees and, and deal with uh, many of the same issues that we're dealing with in Nevada. So um, first of all, I wanna thank the department for inviting me to this conference. My first conference uh, like this with wildlife uh, groups. Uh, and it's, it's like a kid in a candy store. I, I know I keep saying this, but I love, I love this job. Um, I've been a consumer of conservation-oriented stuff for my life, but working into this uh, <clears throat> perspective is uh, so enjoyable for me. So uh, I'm not going to bore you with uh, what a legal committee is going to talk about. We heard everything from Endangered Species Act issues, First Amendment issues, public-private partnership issues. Um, the, the biggest advantage that I thought I gained from this conference was the ability to meet um, attorneys general from the Western states, form good relationships with Utah and Colorado, um, spent a lot of time with them, Oregon, Idaho. Um, so it's nice that I now have people I can talk to. I have phone numbers and emails that I can say, hey, I got this issue. I'm really concerned. What do you guys think? Um, so that's a real advantage for me as an attorney. Um, the, 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 real, the other real advantage we got is kind of a framework for how to look at our uh, legal exposure issues for the state of Nevada. And I'm not gonna talk about uh, <clears throat> all the presentations, but I wanna share one that I thought was really interesting. And that is the state of Utah presented a, uh, an, a presentation on the issue of technology by wildlife agencies both the advantages of this technology, but also the liability and exposure issues that result from uh, use of technology. And Utah presented a, a deer collar study, or a study of uh, 
of deer migration corridors from north to south through somewhere near the Las, uh, Salt Lake Valley, Salt Lake area. And they were showing how they could identify precisely where these deer are going through this valley. And the issue was then, what can we do with this information to advantage uh, land use planners for dealing with how, when we know that these deer are coming through here and we're gonna have private development in the area, what do we do? It was interesting that they were talking about, can we get NGOs to purchase this land to save it for the future and, and allow for this corridor to continue? Or can we require developers when they develop this private land to dedicate portions of this land to allow for the deer to use that corridor in perpetuity. And I thought that was really an interesting use of technology that uh, at least the state of Utah was talking about. And the state of Utah is also very concerned uh, because six years ago they had a case called Francis versus Utah DWR, which was a case where a bear uh, had uh, got into a campground, injured some individuals. Utah went into that campground and DWR went in and closed the campground, chased the bear for four or five hours, couldn't find the bear. The, it was a Sunday night when this occurred. The next day, or as they're leaving the campground area, they see some individuals driving up the road, a family. They wave to them. They don't tell them, stop, turn around, don't use the campground, it's closed. And then, of course, we know what happens then. A young boy is taken by the bear from the campground and killed. And the issue was, is there liability for the state of Utah under those circumstances? And the Utah Supreme Court, after the district court had denied liability, said, yeah, there can be liability for the state of Utah. And that created an interesting framework. Um, that case creates an interesting framework for how we look at exposure issues for the Nevada Department of Wildlife when we do things like collar bears and we do things like collar mountain lions. And if we know these mountain lions or bears are engaged in, for example, they're in the Tahoe Basin and we know that they're moving in and out, is there liability for the department if we don't tell people? Clearly, in my opinion, that's no. Um, but the Utah case does create some concerns for wildlife agencies throughout the West and our use of technology and how we can go about knowing when we're creating exposure for a department and when we're not. Um, so that was interesting. The other one, it was really timely. Be, all the stuff we discussed in, in AFWA for the legal committee was really good for me and timely. We, we saw this Overton overpass and underpass and these, again, um, uses of uh, um, getting across roads for deer. There's a case that's 15 years old in Arizona we talked about in the legal committee that in, discussed elk on roads that were, that were moving through um, highways. And one of the reasons that the court decided that Arizona could have liability was that they s noted that there had been 168 elk or deer collisions in the prior seven years in that case. And I find that interesting because the courts are now using these sorts of numbers to make determinations on, okay, can, can the department be held liable where there's a certain number of collisions? And what's great about what the department is doing here is we're reducing those types of incidences. Not only are we getting a reduction in human-animal conflict or collisions, we're, we're also reducing exposure to the Department of Wildlife because we're creating opportunity, or we're making it safer to cross those roads for these, for these deer. And I think that's an unrecognized aspect of um, what we're doing here with these uh, overpasses. Um, I would say at the same time that we were there, the state of Montana was very concerned because uh, there had been three hunters killed in grizzly bear attacks near Bozeman that week. And the state of Montana was discussing with the legal committee, okay, what exposure do we have if we don't tell these bear hunters or that were elk hunters, um, hey, there's bears in the area. What obligations do we have as a wildlife agency to tell these um, individuals in the area, hey, you know, there's a, there's a bad bear. Those are interesting issues. It creates a good framework for me to look at issues when I try and consider what the department's doing 
and we have issues um, that come up weekly. So it helped me out quite a bit. I wanted to thank the department for that opportunity. I enjoyed it immensely. And I actually offered to prepare a presentation next year if I could before the legal committee if I'm invited back. But thanks. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments? Okay, well, thank you, Director Wosley and Deputy Attorney General Burkett for that report. Uh, we'll then move on to agenda item 19G, it, wildlife. It, excuse me, Chairman Johnson. Um, if you guys could just wait a minute, we did lose our call with Vegas. They've been listening through the YouTube channel. Um, we're just going to reconnect. Okay. Input is invalid. Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter your access code followed by sound or If you are the host, press star now. Otherwise, please enter your PIN followed by the pound or Thank you. There is one host and one participant in this conference. Las Vegas. Hi, Las Vegas. Are you hearing us all right now? Yes. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. We're back online, so we will go to now to agenda item 19G, Wildlife Trust Fund Annual Report. Deputy Director Liz O'Brien, a report will be provided on the investment and expenditure of the money in the Wildlife Trust Fund for the period of July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2019, pursuant to NRS 501.3585. Ms. O'Brien. Included in your packet is the report of the status on the Wildlife Trust Fund for the period of July 1, 2018 through June 30, 2019. The department received $1,029,608.57 in donations and expended $1,009,940.57. This is um, attached to the report as a detail of the gifts that we've received during that time period. And to connect that dot, that would be uh, um, donations from such as Carson Valley Checker Club that's sprinkled throughout there. You'll see those projects that they did for the year um, with both game and habitat. Um, donations are received from a variety of conservation organizations, industry and private citizens in support of the department. These donations save state funds, mostly sportsmen's revenue, and in many instances can be used as match for federal dollars as, at a rate of up to $3 for every $1 donated. In the biennium 2017-2019 legislation, so two biennium ago, we, um, there were changes made to NRS 501.3585, which requires this report to you. And the, the statute was changed. And so this report used to be reported to you semi-annually. And so um, now the, it, the NRS reads, the department shall annually post 
annually post on the internet website maintained by the department a statement setting forth the investment and expenditures of the money in the wildlife trust fund and that annual posting is this report that I give to you so um, as such it is recommended that this report that this report be presented to the com commission annually instead of semi-annually which means that commission policy number one part seven needs to be updated to match this statute. And I do have copies of that here if you want it, or, um, but Kay Kaylee staffs that commission meeting, and so that committee meeting, and we can get that done, or I don't know how you wanna proceed with that, but I just wanted to let you know. I have a list of future agenda items that I keep going okay. <laughs> during, during a meeting, so <laughs> I have it written down. Okay. okay. So is that's all I have. Is there any questions? Any questions for Deputy Director O'Brien? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, we'll move on to agenda item number 20. And just hold on a second, I need to Okay, so agenda item number 20, license appeal, Todd Bradley for possible action. Mr. Bradley is appealing the suspension of his fishing license in 20 states. Is Mr. Bradley here? And I for, I've, I forget your last name, Handy? Handy. It's my understanding that Deputy Attorney General Burkett will be representing the department in this. You represent the commission, correct? That's Deputy De Attorney General Handy. And that the procedures to follow is set out in NAC 501.185? Okay. All right. So the first order is to... Um, I will call to order the appeal hearing that has been requested by Mr. Bradley. Uh, we need to enter into the record the request for the hearing and notice of hearing. If we have those to enter into the record, I believe that would be Mr. Bradley's uh, request for hearing and then the notice that was provided to him of this hearing date. So if we can get those into the record, they were part of our background material, I know that was provided to us. So I'll admit those into the record now. Um, this is not a de novo hearing. Do you intend to have any witnesses other than yourself, Mr. Bradley? No. Okay. Does the department intend to have any witnesses? Okay. Um, it says here that the commission may on its own motion or that of a party exclude witnesses from the hearing. Uh, do you request the rule of exclusion? Okay, Mr. Bradley, do you understand what the rule of exclusion is? No. Okay, you're, you're a party and you'll be representing yourself and you're obviously a witness. You can ask that uh, other witnesses that may be called by the department be excluded from the hearing so they don't hear what everybody's arguing. Do you want to do that or are you ready to proceed without? No, I'm fine. I'm okay. All right, is there any stipulations, preliminary motions, or any orders for us to consider? And I suspect no, I see Mr. Perquette. Do you have any motions to make, Mr. Bradley? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a little ignorant as to the whole process, but. Uh, I, I understand, I'm just following through the administrative code. I'm supposed to call for that. Okay. Uh, so actually the order of business now is the department will present its evidence and then be cross-examined by the appellant. Um, and then, Mr. Bradley, you'll have the opportunity to present evidence on your behalf to substantiate your appeal. But I want to, my, you know, caution and instruct both parties, this is not a de novo hearing. I do not want to hear about the underlying crime, okay? We are here to determine whether or not the department properly suspended your hunting and fishing privileges under the laws that they exist. So that's what I wanna keep this hearing focused on, on both sides. I don't wanna get far afield of that. Do you understand that, Mr. Bradley? Yeah. Do you understand that, Mr. Burkett? Yeah. 
Okay. So with that, Mr. Bradley, if you have a seat, we'll let the department go forward. Okay. And then you will obviously have your opportunity to complete and make your argument and evidence on your behalf. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner and Commission, for the opportunity to present the department's case as it relates to the appeal of Mr. Bradley. What we'd like to do with your permission is um, uh, call Captain Eller to walk through the uh, documents that we provided to the commission for review. We don't intend to cross-examine Mr. Bradley, but we would like an opportunity to conduct a closing after uh, all the evidence is submitted. We don't intend to present a rebuttal either, I should say. Okay. So we just look, what, as far as our, our, uh, our concern is, we're going to call Captain Miller to walk the uh, commission through the documents that we presented, um, and then he will at the same time walk you through, at least as we understand, the regulatory process, the statutes and the regulations that we followed and how they were or were not uh, complied with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call Captain Eller. Uh, I'm Captain I, Brian Eller. Just a minute. Do I need to swear the men? I mean, I don't even. I'm not a notary or anything. So, okay, Mr. Bradley, are you are you comfortable if we proceed without doing official oath, or would you like me to? Understood. Okay, sorry. I just sorry. wanted to clear up that one point <laughs> and then we can proceed now. Captain Brian Eller with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. I was just going to go through our process once we uh, find out a judgment on a case, what our process is, sending letters and uh, informing the individual that his license is going to be uh, revocated. Um, On tab three, that's what started the whole thing, is the, that's the case report done by uh, Game Warden Randy Lucetti. That was his case report, that's what started the process. Then on tab six, that starts off with the order admitting the defendant to probation and fixing the terms there of the probation. And back on page three is the judgment uh, of the case. Once we uh, find out, once the department determines that he's been guilt, uh, sentenced and guilty of a crime, we start our 60 day notice to the individual, uh, according to our NRSs. And we received the judgment on July 31st, 2019. And there he, in the judgment, he was found uh, guilty of uh, unlawful killing of pronghorn antelope category F felony. On tab one is our letter uh, explaining to him that we are going to be in the process, process of revoking his hunting and fishing privileges. We sent that letter out on August 7th. The second page on tab, or I would say the third page on tab two, is all the uh, certified mail receipts. Mr. Bradley signed for this letter on August 13th. Uh, that's the first of letter that we have to send out. It gives him the chance to appeal the process. Uh, on tab four is Mr. Bradley's, uh, what his appeal form. Uh, telling us that he would like to appeal the revocation of his license privileges. He dated that in, on September 8th, which was well in, within the 30 days he had to get his appeal in. 
So then we started on tab five. We sent out our letter informing uh, Mr. Bradley the date of his appeal hearing, which is today. We, on, with that letter, we have 30 days before, according to statute, 30 days to have this out before his appeal hearing, the date of his appeal hearing. We sent that out on October 1st, and so that was in advance of our 30 days before the hearing. And our next time strength was to get the packets out to them and to the commission. We have 14 days to send those out. We sent those out and on the tab five, on the third page there where the return receipt stuff is on that bottom portion right there, that is the date that Mr. that the uh, packets were delivered to Mr. Bradley on uh, October 10th. And that kind of goes over the explanation of our process from going through the NRS on, I think it's tab, tab two is the, the NRS 501-186. Uh, that's the one we follow that has our time constraints and making sure we get all our stuff out in a timely order. And do I have any questions on that, any of this? First of all, Mr. Bradley, do you have any questions for Captain Eller? No, no, I received all their mails. And, uh, okay, but, okay, but I, I want to make sure you understand this is your opportunity right now to cross-examine Captain Eller if you have any questions for him at all. Okay. All right. Does the, anyone from the commission have any questions for Captain Eller? I don't see any. I do not. Mr. Burkett, do you have anything further? I would just like to move for admission of uh, tabs one through seven, the packet provided to the commission. Okay, Mr. Bradley, do you have any objection to that? Okay, I'll, I'll admit one through six, but I don't think we need your witness list of exhibit seven. So the documents in tabs one through six will be admitted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Bradley. Um, and, and I'd like you to let us know right now is not necessarily your closing argument. It's any evidence you want to present to us. Do you understand kind of the difference between the two? Do you have any documents you want to present to us or any evidence you need to present to us rather than argument? No. Okay. Um, so you're offering no evidence? I don't have any, no. Okay. Did you, you did submit, I believe, a supplemental letter to this commission. Uh -huh. It was dated October 19th of 2019 and included with that was your waiver of preliminary examination from the Justice Court. Did you want that into evidence before this commission? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I follow what you mean. The okay. Um, one of the things we did not receive from the department was your letter of October 19th of 19 that and also included a waiver of your preliminary examination. That was where you waived your right to a preliminary hearing in the Justice Court which then you went into the district court in Reno to enter your plea to the felony charge because the felony has to be addressed in the district court rather than in the justice court. So my question is, do you want the letter and the waiver of preliminary examination that you submitted to us admitted into evidence in this hearing? We could let him look at it if Yeah, if you need remember. to review it. Oh. It was a handwritten letter by you with the waiver of preliminary examination. 
Yeah, that's all on file already anyway, right? No, it's not. I don't want to get overly formal. I'm just asking you, if, do you want this as part of the evidentiary record for us to consider? Yes. Okay. Do you have any objection? We'll stipulate. Okay. Then we're going to admit Mr. Bradley's October 19, 2019 letter that included uh, the waiver of preliminary examination. Okay. Do you have any other evidence you want to present to us? No. Okay. Do you rest? Yep. Okay. So why don't you have a seat? We're going to hear a closing argument from Mr. Burkett, and then you'll have an opportunity to pre present your closing argument. And you don't have any rebuttal, correct, Mr. Burkett? That's correct. Okay. So I just want to quickly walk the commission through the process and make sure that you um, understand what the department did here, make the argument on behalf of the department with respect to the process itself. <clears throat> so the first part of this process is a judgment. The judgment was uh, a Category E felony under 501-3763 then. He's he has, um, he loses his license for up to 10 years. That tells the department that. And then under NAC 501-210, under the reg, the department is required to go ahead and revoke for 10 years. That's what the reg says. The department has a requirement to do that. So the department did that in this case. The next thing that happens, of course, then is the department has to timely give notice to the appellant of the revocation of the license. The department has up to 60 days to do that. You have documents in front of you showing that the department did that within six days. After that, of course, then the appellant has the opportunity to present his side of the case. He did so timely. Then the process again, which is of course what you're concerned with here, is the department has a requirement with, to give him an opportunity to have his hearing within 60 days. As Captain Eller showed you that that, that was complied with. The next process that occurs is the appellant has to get notice of the hearing and notice of the, of the potential issues in the hearing. That document was also provided to you and that's what Captain Eller um, identified. That's really what the purpose of this hearing is for. Um, loss of hunting and fishing licenses for 10 years is a serious issue. There's no doubt about that. And we have some sympathy for somebody that loses those licenses. But the commission's obligation here and what we submit to the commission is that this is a review of the process, not a review of the facts of the investigation or the facts of the judgment or the facts of what was or was not communicated to the appellant at any point in the process. It is simply a review of what the process was and did the department comply with that process? And it's the department's contention that all of the duties were complied with. And thank you. Do you have any questions? I do not. Does anyone have any questions for Commissioner Hubbs? Yes, it does look like he, his appeal was timely submitted. Um, however, there was a third party that signed for his notice, uh, Robert Donovan. That's the only thing that I could see that was questionable but seeing that his appeal did come in in time, I'm assuming he must have received notice in some capacity, but I have no idea who Robert Donovan is. That is the department's argument that clearly if he, if he got, didn't get notice, he wouldn't have appealed. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Burkett. Mr. Bradley, thank it's you. now your opportunity to provide your argument to this commission. Um, basically, I cooperated with Fish and Wildlife from the get-go on all this stuff. Um, it was presented to me that the taking of the antelope was a gross misdemeanor. Um, I was quite shocked when the district attorney, when they pressed charges, um, presented it as a felony. Um, 
in addition, nothing was ever mentioned to me from Fish and Wildlife that this was even a possibility. I mean, I, m my first notice was this letter I got in the mail saying they're taking it for 10 years. I was, um, fishing's a huge part of my life. Uh, in fact, that's the whole reason I'm still in California was, um, you know, the ocean fishing. I, uh, avid halibut and salmon fisher, um, yeah, I, I, I can do it without the hunting. That, that's not a big deal. It's the, the, the fishing is just, you know, it's huge to me. So um, in, in Nevada, uh, Nevada, you register your boat through Fish and Wildlife. Um, I, I guess it would be up to your commissioners on, you know, I, I can see uh, somebody gets convicted of a hunting violation that you're not allowed to have a hunting license for 10 years. but the way that they're combining the hunting and fishing um, is, is my, my issue. You know, that, that would be kind of similar as saying that um, I'm no longer allowed to own a boat because I register it through Fish and Wildlife. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, as far as, uh, um, Oh yeah, and then there was, in this packet, there was a part of the plea agreement <clears throat> from the state of Nevada, said no further repercussions would be taken in, on this. So it, it, once again, they had the chance to notify me that this was a possibility, and no, nobody ever said anything to me about it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this guy's writing's hard to read, but um, I believe it's the very last sentence on the on the offer. <clears throat> and, I, and I've read that, Mr. Bradley. Okay. But this wasn't your plea agreement. There should have been a written guilty plea agreement that was entered in the district court when you pled guilty to a felony charge, which I'm assuming you signed and was entered and has not been presented to us. This is the waiver of your preliminary examination. And what I see it says is you were going to pay the $5,000 the $5, civil penalty and forfeit the item seized. State will not pursue further forfeiture, that means forfeiture of property, mm -hmm. nor pursue any transactionally related charges, that means no further criminal charges, or enhancement resulting from this, I believe it says incident, okay? This isn't an, an enhancement? No, uh, I believe that's a, I wasn't there, but that doesn't say, nor do I believe a plea agreement could say, that the law won't be followed in terms of the collateral consequences of the conviction. There are consequences of a criminal conviction, many different types of criminal convictions, that exist as a matter of law outside of the criminal proceeding. <clears throat> so I, I think this would have um, weighed into my agreeing to this to begin with, if, okay. if I had known, I would have fought, you know, to, to have it, I would have taken it to court and had it uh, try to get at least dropped to a gross misdemeanor. I, if I had known anything about this, uh, maybe it's my fault for, for not knowing, not reading the, the fine print or something, but um, I, I received many emails from Nevada Department of Wildlife on a regular basis that, that, that that's your guys' chance to educate the people, to but they're always about things like like family fishing day or or not not about um hey have you spent the last six months of in nevada before you bought your hunting license um you know that you have the opportunity you're connected with many sportsmen to put information in those emails instead of the the content that they they have okay I, that's not really relevant to the issues here uh, my understanding from your appeal is you want this commission to reinstate fishing privileges, believing that revocation of your hunting privileges would be the adequate collateral consequence. Yes. Okay. Do you have additional argument to present to the commission? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Anything further? Anything else you want to share? Any no. questions for Mr. Bradley? Hey, Mr. Burkett, um, I don't think there's not a provision for a rebuttal, and I believe the appellant has the burden of proof 
so I don't, I'm not going to have additional closing argument. I thought the statute said the, dip, the administrative code said otherwise, but it says the appellant has the burden of proof in a hearing specified in this subsec subsection. Oh, great. So, okay, with that, um, the next order of business is the commission will deliberate and then render orally its order with separately stated findings of fact and conclusions of law. So uh, the first step is for us to deliberate um, I'll take a stab at the way I, I view this. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm looking at the wrong, so I'm looking at subsection two rather than subsection one. I'm sorry. Okay, it says closing arguments will be presented by the department and then by the appellant. The department has the burden of proof. We've heard from both sides. I don't think we need to give additional closing argument. The commission will deliberate and render orally. Uh, I'll begin with the deliberation. I, I, there's really no room for this commission to do what Mr. Bradley has requested. And I, I, I'm very sympathetic to Mr. Bradley because I find there's too often in criminal cases criminal defendants not being advised of collateral consequences of a conviction. But that's not something we can remedy as a commission. You pled guilty to two felonies. One of those felonies was a violation of NRS 501.3763. The Madam Administrative Code of 501.200 says that 12 demerit points will be assessed if someone is convicted of unlawfully killing a big game mammal, a category E felony in violation of NRS 501-376, subsection three. And that's the charge you, one of the charges you pled guilty to. And so I don't see where any room existed for the department to do anything other than assess the 12 demerit points. This is confirmed in the judgment that was entered in the criminal case out of the second judicial district court on July 31st of 2019. So upon the assessment of 12 demerit points, the Nevada Administrative Code as well as Nevada statute says the hunting and fishing privileges both are to be revoked and to be revoked for 10 years. That's what the law in this state is. And this commission does not have the ability to bend that law or to excuse it for any reason other than if the department erred in assessing the 12 demerit points. And I don't see any error in that, in this case, given what you pled guilty to. Uh, all the proper notices were submitted. Um, uh, I understand the, the appellant's argument that he wasn't advised of all the collateral consequences. I do not have the written guilty plea agreement in front of me. I do have the waiver of preliminary hearing, but it did not say nor do I believe it could say um, that the law will not be followed in terms of hunting privileges and fishing privileges with the demerit point system. So that's how I see the facts and the law in terms of this initial deliberation. Any other comments or questions, Commissioner Hubbs? I, um, I concur with, with what you stated as well, and it even applies to trapping. I was just going to add that we have to revoke all of those opportunities um, based on the judgments and the orders that are issued here. And I also feel very conflicted about the fact pattern and what happened, especially when I've known many individuals who've had to find work out of state during especially the, the hard economic times that um, individuals, especially in your field of work, suffered in the Reno, Tahoe area. I know several people who had to go find work for their family um, out of state. So again, I um, also am conflicted sometimes with individuals not understanding exactly what they are um, going to get on the other end of the stick when entering into any type of plea 
that's a whole separate topic as uh, Chairman Johnston stated and we cannot remedy what advice you received at that time or what your thoughts were at that time. Um, I do know there are a lot of ramifications for entering a, a criminal uh, plea uh, that you will not be able to work certain jobs out in the for public or private sectors at times. Um, and so knowing exactly what that will be in every sphere of your life is, is very hard to know at that time. So, but I, I agree with your assessment. Thank you. And I'd also note too that um, we have requirements in this state for a written guilty plea agreement, what has to be in it, what doesn't have to be in it. And, and unfortunately, some of these collateral consequences are not a requirement to be in a guilt, written guilty plea agreement. Um, and it's incumbent upon your attorney to advise you of that. I don't know whether that occurred or didn't. What, what I'm faced with is a judgment, a judgment where you pled guilty to two felonies, one felony being the wildlife crime that has a 12 demerit point ramification. And once the 12 demerit points are reached in that specific period of time here, which is met because it's in one incident, neither the department nor this commission has any flexibility other than to do what the department did here. Any other comments or questions? Chairman Johnson, I was also going to state, um, I believe the 10 year requirement too is obligatory as well, pursuant to the charge that he pled guilty to. So we have to um, apply the 10 year standard as well. Yes, uh, NAC 501210 um, speaks to 10 years if the demerits are assessed because of a conviction of a felony for a violation of NRS 501376. And Mr. Bradley pled guilty to a violation of that statute. Um, and that is then in the administrative code, a mandatory 10 year um, revocation uh, of hunting, fishing and, and trapping licenses, permits and privileges uh, and, and no renewal thereof for that 10 year period. If I was to return to the district court, right? Um, I, I, I guess I would have to withdraw my, my plea and then go from there with another attorney. Uh, but if I was able to get it down to a gross misdemeanor, you would automatically be made aware of that and that this would go away or how does that work? I do not know what would happen if this can, this judgment was vacated. I'm assuming that if the judgment was vacated and a new judgment entered that the department would get notice of that and then they'd have to follow that. But in terms of what you can do or should do, I don't think I'm comfortable speaking from this position to give you legal advice as to what your options may be. Okay. I just, I, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm, I happen to be an attorney. I also happen to do some criminal defense work. Okay, and I, I do not want to be sitting here from this chair as the chairman of this commission dispensing legal advice to you in, in a case in which I have to hear a potential appeal and a hearing appeal now. I don't think that would be appropriate. So I'm going to refrain from answering the question any further, and I hope you understand that, Mr. Bradley. Oh, I, I understand that. Um, okay. Yeah. I don't know if there's, I guess it's just I just need to do some research and find out more information on it. Uh, any further deliberation? Okay. Uh, I'll take a stab at making uh, a, a motion and setting out the findings of fact and conclusions of law. Um, NAC 501.200 provides that 12 demerit points will be assessed 
on an individual if that individual is convicted un of unlawfully killing a big game mammal, a category E felony in violation of NRS 501-376. Pursuant to the judgment that was entered in State of Nevada versus Todd Ryan Bradley on August the 1st of 2019 in the Second Judicial District Court of the State of Nevada in and for the County of Washoe. Case number CR 19-0438. Mr. Bradley pled guilty to the crime of unlawful killing of pronghorn antelope, a violation of NRS 501-3763, a category E felony. The department properly assessed 12 demerit points to Mr. Bradley based upon uh, that conviction and judgment entered pursuant to NAC 501210. If someone is to accumulate 12 demerit points uh, for the violation of NRS 501376, their hunting, fishing, Trapping licenses, permits, and privileges are to be revoked for a period of 10 years. The department did that, provided timely notice to Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley timely appealed. Mr. Bradley has not demonstrated uh, any error by the department, and the department has presented sufficient evidence to show that all applicable administrative code sections and statutes were followed in both assessing Mr. Bradley the 12 demerit points and revoking his hunting license and trapping privileges for a period of 10 years. Okay. What's that? Oh. oh, I thought I said that, but it would be hunting, fishing, and trapping license permits and privileges for a period of 10 years. That's my motion in the form of findings of fact, conclusions of law, and therefore the appeal of Mr. Bradley would be denied. So everyone clear on the motion, seconded by Commissioner McNinch. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 8-0 with Commissioner Keo absent. Mr. Bradley, I think, thank you for bringing this to us. I, ho I hope you understand uh, the law as it applies and what we had to do here. <coughs> With that, we'll close agenda item number 20 and move on to agenda item 21. Future commission meetings and commission committee assignments, Secretary Wasley and Chairman Johnston for possible action. The next commission meeting is scheduled for January 24th and 25th, 2020 in Las Vegas. And the commission will review and discuss potential agenda items for that meeting. The commission may change the time and meeting location at this time. The chairman may designate and adjust committee assignments and add or dissolve committees as necessary at this time. Any anticipated committee meetings that may occur prior to the next commission meeting may be discussed. Uh, in terms of committee meetings, I think we'll have a landowner compensation tag committee meeting to hopefully take a first review of the uh, protocol for the counts that we discussed in, in the report today. I don't know if, where the department stands on an initial meeting on regulatory simplification, but if we can get that started, that might be an opportunity to at least start it. It might be a short meeting, just kind of what we're gonna try to do and how to move that forward. Uh, in terms, any other committee meetings anticipated in connection with the Las Vegas meeting? Commissioner Hubbs? We're we gonna look at the horse, the feral horse policy. I'm just <coughs> looking to see if any committee chair people mm -hmm. have any additional committee meetings and then I was gonna get to agenda items. Okay. Any other, okay. So I have potential agenda items as follows. Commission policy number 67. A potential agenda item of reissuing tags that currently cannot be reissued in that two week window. Uh, potential adoption of the veteran waterfowl season 
no regulation to that effect. Uh, an update on the uh, Fallon Naval Air Station withdrawal. Uh, we have CGR 488 and 489, the landowner compensation tag regulation and shed antler reg that were taken off this agenda today. And potential revision of policy number one. I also have a potential uh, agenda item for uh, heritage funds and with the changes in the law, start discussions on some frameworks as to, or some guidance as to how those protocol or parameters or sideboards on um, expenditures. And I think that's all I have, uh, except for the normal agenda items that are, are reoccurring. I don't know if you had anything else, Commissioner or Secretary Waslin. Uh, just uh, a couple, a couple items. I, I would like to mention that uh, because it is the the big game season setting meeting, that we will be uh, teleconferencing to both Reno and uh, <clears throat> making every attempt to provide that to Elko as well. Elko um, has traditionally been teleconferenced for the season setting and quota setting. Um, so we're, we will explore um, the opportunity to teleconference to both Reno and Elko. Um, the items I have include the uh, draft predation management plan, uh, big game seasons, which are set in the odd number of years, amended in even number of years, so that would be 2020 with the opportunity to amend. Uh, black bear seasons, which are set annually. Mountain lion limits and quotas uh, also set annually, and that season is in NRS. And the heritage tag seasons and quotas set annually a year in advance. The Dream Tag uh, partners, uh, Partnership and Wildlife Silver State Tag Seasons and Quotas uh, set annually. Uh, the Big Game Application Deadline and Tag Eligibility set annually. Um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, the standing agenda items, uh, the Department Project Update at this point in time, we're um, exploring an opportunity to get an update on the Muddy River and Warm Springs natural areas. Uh, with even the possibility of a, of a field trip, depending on the weather. Um, the reports will, at that point in time, uh, include a WAFWA midwinter conference report as WAFWA occurs, midwinter conference occurs in early January. Um, in addition to the discussion regarding potential commission guidance on future spending of the heritage, uh, this is the commission meeting where the department provides a report on the heritage account. Um, with the commission's uh, blessing, we would also like to share with you the relevancy roadmap. And then um, would accept any ideas or input that the commission may have regarding uh, conservation spotlight. Um, organization or individual that the commission would like to hear from in Southern Nevada uh, relative to that standing agenda item. And that concludes the items I have in addition to those that you mentioned. Commissioner Valentine. If I might, um, I'd like to request an agenda item to discuss the uh, bonus point uh, tag return situation that came out of the TAC committee. For the party hunt? Yes, for the party hunt. Any others? Okay, it is an action item, so I will ask for public comment in Las Vegas on this item. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Oh, no public comment, sorry. Okay, thank you. Any public comment in Reno on this agenda item? Okay, seeing none, is there something else, Secretary Wasley? Just related to the uh, potential agenda item uh, the Commissioner Valentine just referenced, and 
thinking about the timeline, if there is a desire by the commission to address that issue prior to the next uh, application period, uh, and I, I don't recall how uh, how that TAC uh, addressed that or, or if there was some consensus or there was some finality to the direction there, but uh, if there is, and we can go back and look at that, it, it may be possible to actually present that as a, as a workshop item so that that can be uh, advanced in potentially in time for this year's application period. I think there was consensus on the tech. Is that correct? That's correct. So let's do it as a workshop based upon the recommendation of the tech rather than just a report from the tech so we can get it moving forward. Okay. Anything else on this agenda item? All right, with that, then we'll move on to our final agenda item, agenda item 22, public comment period. Persons wishing to speak are requested to complete a speaker's card and present it to the recording secretary. Public comment will be limited to three minutes. No action can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Any public comment in Las Vegas? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, good morning. For the record, Fred Bolt. Although over a month has passed since the last Wildlife Commission meeting, there's been no progress in bringing forward deliberations about a ban on wildlife killing contests in Nevada, as Arizona and other states have already implemented. Wildlife killing contests have nothing to do with ethical hunting or following the precepts of the North American model for wildlife conservation. These contests are no more than mass indiscriminate slaughter fests of as many animals as possible in a relatively small area all for trophies, prizes, and bragging rights over winning the biggest amount of money and stacking up the highest body count, mausoleum style. These unregulated contests are as foolish as claiming genocide helps with human overpopulation management. Wildlife killing contests are as destructive to the landscape as a flash flood, wildfire, strip mining, clear cut, cutting vast swaths of mature trees, or excessively farming and grazing land to the point where it is completely inert. And biologically speaking, wildlife killing contests create an incredible vacuum in a given area's balance between wildlife species whose numbers at best are a guesstimate and at worst completely unknown. For those commissioners who claim they are representing their people when they ignore the destructive nature of these contests, let's remember when the commission took action to ban commercial pitfall trapping of reptiles after seeing the carnage on a field trip to the Amargosa Valley a few years ago. Lest you think it's a small fraction of the population that finds trophy hunting abhorrent, you might wish to read a study conducted by the very pro-hunting groups, Responsive Management and the National Shooting Sports Foundation this year. They found that only 29% of over 3,000 telephone survey takers approve of hunting solely for a trophy or prize. 5% had no opinion or were indifferent and an overwhelming 66% disapproved. The negative optics created by the Cecil episode in Africa are not a good image for the hunting brethren or for a wildlife department staffed by biologists who are trained and tasked to concern themselves with conservation of our wildlife species. Staff's responsibilities, of course, do not mean a focus on only on artificially setting wildlife up for the next hunting season, but perpetuating wildlife's existence into the future. Mass killing of any species creates a huge vacuum on the land. Good stewards of Nevada's wildlife species and their future viability need to expressly delete reckless wildlife killing contests from lawful hunting activities. Nevada needs initiative from its Wildlife Commission and Department on this subject without further delay or indifference. And I would ask that my comments be added verbatim to the meeting record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Volz. Any additional public comment in Las Vegas? That concludes comment. Thank you. Thank you. Any public comment here in Reno? Seeing none, we'll stand adjourned and see everybody in Southern Nevada in January. Uh, everybody have a wonderful holiday season. It's surprising that it's upon us already, but it is. So.